Okay. Well, there is um, something went wrong with my uh, application for my character model. Therefore, there's no uh, character model today. <laughs> That's all I can say. Hey, what's up? Hey, good morning. All right. Um, here's what's happening. There's no character model of me uh, at the bottom left corner, as usual, as I always do. There's nothing. There's nothing there because I couldn't switch it on. Uh, there's something wrong with my computer. I think I don't know. I updated it recently. Uh, not. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, don't cry yeah it's something strong I don't know what's happening I look into it there's some error uh, I probably need to do it later like you know windows diagnostics and stuff but I can't do anything I, I don't want to like postpone the reading so um, I'm gonna do it now because I've some I had to go out later, so I gotta make sure that I finish this within two hours. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know what the fuck happened. I probably I probably just restart the computer and see what's up, you know. Um, otherwise, otherwise I don't know. But yeah. Um... Yeah... Anyway, yeah, I think we probably can um, finish up the, the book today. Uh, do I probably... We can start a new book next week. If I will, next week, we'll see. Yeah, is it weird? Isn't it weird that we don't have the character model right now? I tried to switch it on like multiple times. I don't know what to do. That's like an error. And I, when I look at the error, it says that it's a Windows error and it's not the app error. So maybe I'll just I'll maybe I'll try to re-download the air application, but uh, we'll 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 see. We'll we shall see. Anyway, we shall see. Uh, anyway, guys. Uh, good day, guys. Uh, you guys having fun? Are you guys doing well? Are you guys happy? Anyway, anyway, I don't know if anyone look at the follower goal, but it's been like. <laughs> it's been stuck there forever and some people followed and unfollowed me. I don't know why I didn't do anything. I'm not a controversial person. I don't know why I didn't do anything. Like, I don't even like spam people. Is that PL? No, that's Dia. Sorry. I forgot. I always forget that you change your character model. Jesus. Thank you. Sit down. <coughs> we'll start. Um, yeah, guys, I, I don't know what to do. Is my life doing okay? Oh, hey! Oh my god, my chat is not even... Oh my god. 
bro. My OBS. My OBS is not even refreshing properly. There's something wrong. Hey, Ando. Thank you so much. No worries. There's something very wrong. Are, are you guys watching this okay? Like, is it okay on you, your guys' end? Because on OBS, I'm just stuck at one screen right now and I don't even know what to do about it. I guess I'll just like stay like this and then I'll start reading. Oh, someone's here. Oh, hey, Gail. Hello, Gail. Good day, Gail. Uh, nice to meet you. I think this is your first time. Thank you so much. Uh, we are actually finishing a book right now. I want to switch over to. Uh, other screen because OBS is just not uh, something is wrong with OBS as well it's not just my computer is like dying maybe I don't know <laughs> I just got this computer yet last year I don't know okay anyway stop talking so much and start reading okay guys here it is. Today we are finishing up Kazuo Ishiguro's The Buried Giant. Uh, there are only two chapters. It's not very long. I don't think it's very long. And we probably can finish within an hour and a half or two hours time. Okay? Uh, let's start. Hi hi. Hi good doggo1209. Thank you for dropping by. Uh, thank you. I hope you all enjoyed the reading session. So, oh, thank you for the follow. Thank you. Thank you for the follow. Thank you so much. Okay, so like I'm saying like I said, uh okay, uh for uh a good doggo on my chat right, right now. Uh just to explain to you what Nudible is about. Nudible is a play on words on Audible and Nuna, my last name in this game. And uh, what I do is I pick a book and I read it basically on stream. Usually I have a little VTuber character thingy on the bottom left of my the beside the martini glass, but uh something's wrong with my computer today and I need to like fix it. Uh unfortunately that I don't have time. I don't want to delay the reading. I'm already delaying delaying a lot right now <laughs> by talking nonsense. Anyway, um today uh we are finishing up the book The Buried Giant by uh, Kazuo Ishiguro So, unfortunately you join when we are finishing the book But uh, I think next week onwards we are going to start, start a new book So kindly follow uh, my channel uh, You get a notification email when you if you choose to have notification uh, When I go live I don't go live a lot so you probably won't get spam a lot um, Follow me on Twitter. Uh, follow me on. Uh, I mean, join my Discord even to uh, to 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 find out when I go live. I don't go live a lot, so seriously, I don't spam a lot. <laughs> you can ask the end. <laughs> anyway, let's go. Uh, part four of the Buried Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro, chapter fifteen. Some of you will have fine mo monuments by which the living may remember the evil done to you. Some of you will only have crude wooden crosses or painted rocks, while yet others of you must remain hidden in the shadows of history. You are in any case part of an ancient procession, procession and so it is always possible to the giant can. I need to find out how to. Sorry, I need to find out how to pronounce this word. Care, 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 care. Can, can, not can, 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 like, like popcorn kernel. Can, 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 can. Sorry. 
while yet others must remain hidden in the shadows of history. You are, in any case, part of an ancient procession, and so it is always possible the giant kin can was erected to mark the site. Sorry, to mark the site of some such tragedy long ago when young innocents were slaughtered in the war. This aside, it is not easy to think of a reason for its standing. One can see why, on lower ground, our ancestors might wish, might have wished to commemorate a victory or a king. But why stack heavy stones to above a man's height in so high and remote a place like this? It was a question, I am sure, equally to baffle Axel as he came wearily up the mountain slope. When the young girl had first mentioned the giant's kern, he had pictured something atop a large mound. Yet this kern had simply appeared before them on the incline, no feature around it to explain its, its presence. The goat, nonetheless, seemed immense it seems Im immediately to sense its significance struggling frantically as soon as the kern had become visible as a dark finger against the sky it knows its fate sir gawain had remarked guiding his horse with beatrice in the saddle but now the goat had forgotten its earlier dread and was chewing the mountain grass contently can it be curic's mist works can it be Curic's mist works its mischief on goats and men alike? It was Beatrice who asked this as she held on with both hands on the animal's rope. Axel had for the moment relinquished the creature while he hammered into the ground with a stone the, the wooden stake around which the rope had been wound. Who knows, princess, but if God cares at all for goats, he will bring the she-dragon here before long, or it will be a lonely way for this poor animal. If, it, if the goat dies first, Axel, do you suppose she will still sup on meat, not living and fresh? Who knows how a she-dragon likes her meat, but there's grass here to keep this goat a while, princess, even if it's, it's of a mean sort. Look there, Axel. I thought the knight would help us, weary as we both are, but he's forgotten his usual manners. Indeed, Sir Gawain had become oddly reticent since their arrival at the Kern. This is the place you seek, he had said in an almost sulky voice before wandering off, and now he stood with his back before them, staring at the clouds. Sir Gawain, Axel called out, pausing from his work. Will you, not ex will you not assist holding this goat? My poor wife grows tired from it. The old knight did not react, and Axel, assuming he had not heard, was about to repeat his request when Gawain suddenly turned, and with such a look of solemnity, they both stared at him. I see them below, the old knight said, and nothing now to turn them. Who is it that you see, sir? Axel asked. Then, when the knight remained silent, Are they soldiers? We watched earlier some long column on, column on the horizon, but thought they moved away from us. I speak of your recent companion, sir. The same with whom you travelled yesterday when we met. They emerged from the wood below, and who will stop them now? For a moment, I raise the hope I merely look on two black widows strayed from the infernal procession, but it was the cloudy sky paid playing its tricks, and it's them, no mistake. So, must the wisdom escape the monastery after all? Axel said. That he did, sir, and now he comes, and on his rope not a goat, but the Saxon boy to guide him. At last... Sir Gawain seemed to notice Beatrice struggling with the animal and came hurriedly from the cliff edge to seize the rope. But Beatrice did not let go, and for a moment it was as if she and the knight was tussling for control of the goat. In time they stood steadily, both holding the rope, and the old knight a step or two in front of Beatrice. 
and have our friends in turn seen us here, Sir Gawain? Axel asked, returning to his task. I'll wager the warrior has keen eyes and sees us even now against the sky. Figure in a tug contest to goat our opponent. He laughed to himself but a melancholy lingered in, in his voice. Yes, he said finally. I fancy he sees us well enough. Then he joined forces with us. Then he joins forces with us, Beatrice said, to bring down the she dragon. Sir Gawain looked from one to the other uneasily. Then he said, Master Axel, do you still persist in believing it? Believing in what, Sir Gawain? That we gather here in the forsaken spot as, as comrades. Make your meaning clearer, Sir Knight? Gawain let the goat to where Axel was kneeling, oblivious of Beatrice following behind, still clutching her end of the rope. Master Axel, didn't our ways part years ago? Mine remained with Arthur, while yours. He seemed now to become aware of Beatrice behind him and turning about politely. Dear lady, I beg you, let go of this rope and rest. I will not let the animal escape. Sit down beside the cairn can over there. It will shelter at least some part of you from this wind. Thank you, Sir Gawain. Beatrice said, then I'll trust you with this creature, and it's a precious one to us. She began to make her way towards the, the cairn, and something about the way she did so, her shoulders hunched against the wind, causing a fragment of recollection to stir on the edges of Axel's mind. The emotion it, it provoked, even before he could hold it down, surprised and shocked him. For mingle with the overwhelming desire to go to her now and shelter her were a distinct shadows of anger and bitterness. She had talked of a long night spent alone, tormented by his absence, but could it be he too had known such a night or even several of similar anguish? Then, a Beatri as Beatrice stopped before the kern and bowed her head to, uh, to, to the stones as if in apology, he felt both memory and anger growing firmer, and a fear made him turn away from her. Only then did he notice Sir Gawain also gazing over at Beatrice, a look of tenderness in his eyes seemingly lost in his thoughts. But the knight soon collected himself and coming closer to Axel, lean, leaning right down as though to remove any small chance of Beatrice overhearing. Who's to say your path wasn't the more godly, he said, to leave behind all great talk of war and peace, leave behind a fine law to bring men closer to God, to leave behind Arthur once and for all and devote yourself to... He glanced over again to Beatrice, who had remained on her feet, her forehead almost touching the piled stone in her effort to escape the wind. To a good wife, sir. I've watched how she goes beside you as a kind of shadow. Should I have done the same? Yet, God guided us down separate paths. I had a duty. Haha. <laughs> and do I fear him now? Never, sir. Never. I accuse you of nothing. That great law you broke it, torn down in blood, yet it held well for a time. Torn down in blood? Who blames us for it now? Do I fear youth? Is it youth alone can defeat an opponent? Let him come. Let him come. Remember it, sir. I saw you that very day and you talk of cries in your ears of children and babes. I heard the same, sir. Yet were they not the cries of the surgeon's tent when a, not, when a man's life is spared even as the cure brings agonies? Yet I admit it. There are days I long for a kind of shadow to follow me. Even now, I turn in hope to see one. Doesn't every animal, every bird in the sky crave a tender companion? There were one or two I would willingly have given my years. Why should I fear him now? I fought fang sea raiders with reindeer snouts, and they have no mask. Here, sir, tie your goat now. 
How much deeper will you drive that stake? Is it a goat you tether or a lion? Handing Axel that the rope, Gawain went striding off, not stopping till he stood where the land's edges edge appeared to meet the sky. Axel on one knee pressed into the grass, tied sorry. Tied tied the rope tightly around the notch in the wood, then looked once more over to his wife. She she was standing at the cairn. Much as before, and though something in her posture again tugged at him, he was relieved to find himself at no trace of earlier bitterness. Instead, he felt almost overcome with an urge to defend her, not just from the harsh wind, but from something else large and dark even then gathering around them. He rose and hurried to her. The goat's well secured, princess, he said. Just as soon as you are ready, let's be off this slope. For heaven, we completed the errand promised to those children and to ourselves. Oh, Hexel, I don't want to go back to those woods. What are you saying, princess? Hexel, you never went to the pond's edge. You were so busy talking to this knight, you never looked into the chilly water. These winds have tired you, princess. I saw their faces staring up as if resting in their beds. Who, princess? The babes! And only a short way beneath the water's surface, I thought first they were smiling and then some waving. But then when I went nearer, I saw how they were laying and moving. Just another dream come to you while you rested against that tree. I remember seeing you falling asleep there and took comfort from it at the time, even as I talked with the old knight. I truly saw them, Axel, among the green weeds. Let's not go back to the woods, for I am sure some evil lingers there. Sir Gawain, gazing down at the view and had raised his arm in the air, and now, without turning, shouted through the wind, They'll soon be upon us! They come up the slope eagerly. Let's go to him, princess, but keep the cloak around you. I was foolish to bring you this far, but we'll soon find shelter again. Yet, let's see what troubles the good knight. The goat was pulling at its rope as they passed, but the stake showed no sign of shifting. Axel had been, had been keen to see how near the approaching figures were, and they were all three halted not far from where the animal was tethered. Sir Gawain, Axel said. My wife grows weak and must return to the shelter and food. May we carry her down on your horse as we brought her up? What's this, you ask? Too much, sir. Did I not tell you when we met in Merlin's wood to climb this hill no further? It was you both insisted on coming here. Perhaps we were both foolish, sir, but we had a purpose, and if we return, and we must turn back to you without you, you must promise not to free this goat cause cost us dearly to bring here. Free the goat? What do I care about your goat, sir? The Saxon warrior will soon be upon us and what a fellow he is. Go look if you doubt it. What do I care for your goat? Master Axel, I see you before me now and I'm reminded of that night. The wind as fierce then as this one and you cursing Arthur to his face while rest of rest of us stood with heads bowed. For who wanted the task of striking you down, each of us hiding from the king's eyes for fear he would command with one glance to run you through unarmed though you were. But see, sir, Arthur was the great king, and here's more proof of it. You cursed him before his finest knights, yet he replied gently to you. You recall this, sir? I recall nothing of it, Sir Gawain. Your she-dragon your she dragon's breath keeps it all from me. My eyes lowered like the rest, expecting your head to roll past my feet even as I gazed down at them. Yet Arthur spoke to you with gentleness. You don't, re you don't re recall even a part of it. The wind that night, almost as strong as this one, our tent ready to fly into the dark sky. Yet Arthur meets curses with gentle words. He thank you for your service, for your friendship. And he bade us all think of you with honor. I myself whispered farewell to you, sir, as you took your fury into the storm. You didn't hear me. 
for it was said under my breath but a sincere farewell all the same, and I was not alone. We all share something of your anger, sir. Even if you did nothing to curse, if, even if you did nothing wrong to curse Arthur, and on the very day of his great victory, you say now Kirik's breath keeps this from your mind, or is it the years alone or even this win enough to make the wisest monk a fool? I don't care for any of these memories, Sir Gawain. Today I seek others from another stormy night my wife speak of. A sincere farewell I bade you, sir. And let me confess it, when you cursed Arthur, a small part of me spoke through you. For that was a great treaty you broke it, and well kept and well held for years. Didn't all men, Christian or pagan, sleep more easily for it, even on the eve of battle, to fight knowing our innocence safe in our villages? And yet, sir, the wars didn't finish. When where once we fought for land and God, we now fought to avenge fallen comrades themselves slaughtered in vengeance. Where could it end? Babes growing to men knowing only days of war and your great law already suffering violations. The law was well held on both sides until that day, Sir Gawain, Axel said. It was unholy it was an unholy thing to break it. Ah, now you recall it. My memories of God himself betrayed, sir, and I am not sorry if the mist rocks me further from it. For a time I wish the same of the mist, Master Axel. Yet soon I understood the hand of a truly great king, for the war stopped at last. Wasn't that so, sir? Hasn't peace been our companion since that day? Remind me no more, Sir Gawain. I don't thank you for it. Let me see instead the life I led with my dear wife shivering here beside me. Will you not lend us your horse, sir? At least down to the woods where we met. We'll leave him there safely to, to await you. Oh, Axel, I will not return to those woods. Why insist we leave this place now and go down there? Can it be, husband, you still fear the mist fading? Never mind the promise I made you. My horse, sir. You imply I have no more use of my Horace? You go too far, sir. I don't fear him even if his youth is on his side. I imply nothing, Sir Gawain. Only ask for the assistance of your excellent horse to carry my wife down the shelter. My horse, sir? Do you insist his eyes be masked or watch his master's fall? He's a battle horse, sir. Not a pony frolics in buttercups. A battle horse, sir. And well ready to see me fall or triumph on God's wheels. If my wife must travel on my back alone, sir, knight, so be it. Yet I thought you might spare your horse at least the distance down to the wood. I'll remain here, Axel. Never mind this cruel wind. And if... Master Winston's nearly upon us. We'll stay and see if it's him or the she dragon survives this day. Or is it you who would rather not see the mist fade after all, husband? I've seen it before many times, sir. An eager young one brought down by a wise old head many times. Sir, let me implore you again to remember your gentlemanly ways. This wind drains my wives of energy. Is it not enough, husband? I swore you an oath, and only this morning that I would not let go what I feel in my heart for you today, no matter what the mist fading reveals. Will you not understand the acts of a great king, sir? We can only watch and wonder a great king like God himself must perform deeds tomorrow flinch from. Do you think there were none that caught my eye? The attendant flower or two passed on the way I didn't long to press to my bosom. Is this metal coat to be my only bedfellow? Who calls me a coward, sir? Or a slaughterer of babes? Where were you that day? Were you with us? My helmet! I left it in the woods. But what of it now? The armor, too. I'll take it off. But I fear you are laughing to see the skin box beneath. 
for a moment. All three of them were shouting over each other, the howl of the wind, a fourth voice against the earth. And now, Axel became aware that both Gawain and his wife had fallen silent and were staring past his shoulder. Turning, he saw the warrior and the Saxon boy standing at the cliff's edge, almost on the very spot where before Sir Gawain had been gazing broodingly out at the view. The sky had thickened so that so that to Axel it was as if the newcomers had been had been carried here on the clouds. Now both of them in near silhouette silhouette appeared peculiarly transfixed the warrior, holding firm on his rein rain in both hands like a charioter, the boy leaning forward at an angle, both arms outstretched as though for balance. There was a new sound in the wind, and then Axel heard Sir Gawain say, Ah! The boy sings again. Can you not make him cease, sir? Winston gave a laugh, and the two figures lost their rigidity, rigidity and came towards them, the boy pulling in front. My apologies, the warrior said, yet it's all I can do to stop him from leaping rocks to rocks till he breaks himself. What can be the matter with the boy, Axel? Beatrice said, close to his ear, and he was grateful to hear the gentle intimacy return to her voice. He was just this way before the dog appeared. Must he sing so untunefully? Sir Gawain addressed Wisdom. I would box his ears, but fear he would not even feel me. The warrior, still approaching, laughed again, then glanced cheerfully at Axel and Beatrice. My friends, this is a surprise. I fancy you'd be in your son's village by now. What brings you here instead of this lonely spot? Eh, what brings you here to this lonely spot? The same business as yours, Master Wisdom. We crave the end to this she-dragon who robs us of our treasured memory. You see, sir, we have brought us with us a poisoned goat to do our work. Our work. Wisdom regarded the animal and shook his head. This must be the mighty and cunning creature we face, friends. I fear your goat may not trouble her beyond a belch or two. It takes us greatly to bring it, bringing it here, Master Winston. Beatrice said, even if we were helped by this good knight, met again on the way up. But seeing you here, I am cheered, for it must be our hopes no longer rest solely with our animal. But now... Edwin singing was making it hard for them to hear one another, and the boy was tugging more than ever, the object of his attention quite evidently a spot at the crest of the next slope. Winston gave the rope a sharp pull and said, Master, Wis Master Edwin appears anxious to reach those rocks up there. Sir Gawain, what lies in them? I see stones pile one upon another, as though to hide a pit of flare. Why ask me, sir? said Sir Gawain. Ask your young companion, and he may even stop his songs. I hold him by the leash, sir, but no more can no more control him than a crazed goblin. Master Wisdom, Axel, Axel said, we share a duty to keep this boy from harm. We must watch him carefully in this high place. Well said, sir. I'll feather him, if I may, to the same post as your goat. The warrior led Edwin to where Axel had hammered in the stake, crouching down and began securing the boy's rope to it. Indeed, it seemed to Axel that Winston lavished unusual care on this task, testing repeatedly each knot he made, as well as the soundness of Axel's handiwork. Meanwhile, the boy himself remained oblivious. He calmed somewhat, but his gaze stays fixed on the rocks at the top of the slope, and he continued to tug with quiet, insist quiet insistence. His singing, though far less shrill, had gained a dog quality that reminded Axel of the way exhausted soldiers singing to keep marching. For its part, the goat had moved as far as away as its own rope would allow but was nonetheless gawping in fascination. As for Sir Gawain, he had been watching Wisdom every movement with care, and so it seemed to Axel a kind of sly cunning had come into his eyes as the Saxon warrior had become absorbed in his task. 
The knight had moved stealthily closer, dra drawn out his sword, planting it into the soil, leant, leaned his weight on it. Forearm resting on the broad hilt. In this stance, Gawain was now watching Winston, and it struck Axel that he might be memorizing details concerning the warrior's person, his height, his reach, the strength in the calves, and the strapped left arm. His work completed to his satisfaction, Winston rose and turned to face Sir Gawain. For a small moment, there was a strange uneasiness in the looks they exchanged. Then, Winston smiled warmly. Now, there's a custom divides Britons from Saxons, he said, pointing. See there, sir. Your sword's drawn and you use it to rest your weight as if it's your cousin to a chair or, or a footstool to a sac to any Saxon warrior, even one taught by Britons as I was, it seems a strange custom. Grow to my creaky ears, sir, and you'll see if it seems so strange. In days of peace like this, I fancy a good sword, only to too glad of the work, even if just to relieve its owner's bones. What's odd about it, sir? But observe, Sir Gawain, how it presses into the earth. Now, to a Saxon, the, board's, the sword's edge is a thing of never sleeping worry. We fear to show a blade even the air lest it lose a tiny part of its edge. Is that so? A sharp's edge is important, of importance, Master Wisdom. I will not dispute, but isn't there too much made of it? Good footwork, sound strategy, calm courage, and that little wilderness made a warrior hard to predict. These are what determine a contest, sir, and the knowledge of God wills one's victory. So let an old man rest his shoulders. Besides, and this. And there are times a sword left in the sheaths drawn to, too late. I've stood this way on many a battlefield to gather breath, comforted my blades already out and ready, and it won't be rubbing its eyes and asking if it's afternoon or morn, even as I try to put it to good use. Then it must be us Saxons who keep our swords more heartlessly, for we demand they not sleep at all even as they rest in the dark in their scabbards. Take my own here, sir. It knows my manner well. It doesn't expect to take the air without soon touching flesh and bone. A difference in custom then, sir. Sir, it reminds me of a Saxon I once knew, a fine fellow, and he and I gathering kindling on a cold night. I would be busy my sword to hack from a dead tree, Yet there he is beside me, employing his bare hands and sometimes a blunt stone. Have you forgotten your blade, sir? I ask him. Why go at it like a sharp clawed bear? But he wouldn't hear me. At the time I thought he praised. Yet now you enlighten me. Even with my years, there are still lessons to learn. They both laughed briefly, then Winston said, There may be more than custom on my side, Sir Gawain, I always thought, that even as my blade travels through at one opponent, I must, in my thought, prepare the cut that will follow. Now, if my edge isn't sharp, sir, and the blade's passage slowed even a tiny instant, snag in bone or dawdling through the tangles of a man's insight, I'll surely be late for the next cut, and on such may hang victory or defeat. You're right, sir. I believe it's old age, and these long years of peace make me careless. I'll follow your example from here. Yet, just now my knees sag from the climb, and I beg you allow me this small relief. Thank you, Dian. Of course, sir. Take your comfort. Merely a thought struck me, seeing you rest that way. Suddenly, Edwin stopped singing and began to shout. He was making the same statement over and over, and Axel turned, turning to Beatrice beside him and asked quietly, what is, the, what is it he says, princess? He talks of some bandit's camp lies up there. He bids us all follow him to it. Winston and Gawain was both staring at the boy, 
something like embarrassment. For another moment, Edwin continued to shout and pull, then silent, slumping down onto the ground and appeared on the verge of tears. No one spoke of what happened. Uh, no one spoke for what seemed a long time, and the wind howling between them. Sir Gawain, Sir Gawain, Axel said finally, we now look to to you, sir. Let's keep no more disguises between us. You are the she dragon protector, are you not? I am, sir. Gawain gazed at each of them in turn. Edwin included with an air of defiance, her protector. And lately, her only friend. The monks kept her fed for years, leaving tattered animals at this spot as you do. But now, they quarrel among themselves, and Curic senses the treachery. Yet, she knows I stay loyal. Then Sir Gawain, Winston said, Will you care to tell us if we stand near the she-dragon now? She is near, sir. You have done well to arrive here even if you had good fortune stumbling on that boy for a guide. Edwin, who was back on his feet, began to sing mo once more, albeit in a low chant-like manner. Master Edwin here may prove of greater fortune yet, said the warrior, for I have had a hunch he is a pupil to quickly surpass his poor master and one day do great things for his kin. Perhaps even as your Arthur did this did, did for him. What, sir? This boy now singing and tugging like a half-wit. Sir Gawain. Sir Gawain? Beatrice interrupted. Tell weary old woman, if you will. How is it a fine knight like you and a nephew to the great Arthur turn out to this... Turn out to this... She-dragon's protector. Perhaps Master Winston's here keen to explain it, mistress. On the contrary, I am as eager as Mistress Beatrice to hear your account of it. Yet, all in good time. First, we must settle one question. Will I cut loose Master Edwin to see where he runs? Or will you, Sir Gawain, lead the way to Curic's lair? Sir Gawain stared emptily at the struggling boy, then sighed. Leave him where he is, he said heavily. I'll lead the way. He, he straightened to his full height, pulled the sword from the ground caref and carefully returned it to his scabbard. I thank you, sir, Winston said. I am grateful we spared the boy the danger, yet I may now guess the way without a guide. We must go to the rocks atop this next slope, must we not? Sir Gawain sighed again. Glanced at, Max, glanced at Axel as though for help, then shook his head sadly. Quite right, sir, he said. Those rocks circle a pit, and no small one, a pit as deep as a quarry, and you will find Kyrick asleep there. If you really mean to fight her, Master Winston, you'll have to climb down into it. Now, I ask you, sir, do you really mean to do such a wild thing? I've come this long way to do so, sir. Master Winston, Beatrice said, if you will excuse an old woman's intrusion, you laughed just now at our goat, but this is a great battle you face. If this knight will not help you, at least allow us to take the goat up to this last slope and prod it down into the pit. If you must fight a she-dragon single-handed, let it be one slowed down by poison. Thank you, mistress. Your constance well received. Yet, while I may take advantage of her slumber, poison's a weapon I don't care to employ. Besides, I lack the patience now to wait enough another half day or more to discover if she if the she dragon will be sickened from her supper. Then let's have it over with, Sir Gawain said. Come sir, I'll lead the way. Then Axel and Beatrice wait down and then to Axel and Beatrice wait down here friends and hide from the wind beside the kern. You will not wait long. But Sir Gawain Beatrice said My husband and I have stretched our strength to come this far. We'll walk with you this last slope if there's a way to do so without danger. Sir Gawain once again shook his head helplessly then let's then said 
let's all go together, friends. I dare say no harm will befall you, and I'll be an easier I'll be easier myself for your presence. Come, friends, let's go to Kyrick's lair and keep your voices low, lest she stir from her sleep. As she ascended the next path, and the wind grew less harsh, and though, and as though they felt more than ever to be touching the sky, the knight and the warrior were striding steadily before them, and all the world like two old companions taking air together. And before long, a distance had opened between them and the elderly. This is this is foolishness, princess," Axel said as they walked. What business do we have following this gentleman? And who knows what dangers lie ahead? Let's turn back and wait beside the boy. But Beatrice said, remain determined. I'll have us go on, she said. Here, Axel, take my hand and help me keep my courage. For now, I'm thinking I'm the only one to fear most the mist clearing, not you. I stood beside those stones just now and it came to me. There were dark things I did to you once, husband. Feel how this hand trembles in yours to think they may return to us. What will you say to me then? Will you turn away and leave me on this bleak hill? There's a part of me would like would see this brave warrior fall even as he walks before us now. Yet I will not have us hide. No, I will not, Axel. And aren't you the same? Let's see freely this path we have come together, whether in the dark or the mellow sun. And if this warrior must really face a she-dragon in her own pit, let's do what we can to keep up his spirits. It may be a shout of warning in the right place, or one to rouse him from a fierce blow will make the difference. Axel had let her walk talk on, listening with only half his mind as he walked, because he had become aware once more of something at the far edge of his memory, a stormy night, a bitter hurt, a loneliness opening before him like unfathomed, like, like unfathomed waters. Could it really have been he, not Beatrice, standing alone in their chamber, unable to sleep, a small candlelight lit before him? What became of our son, princess? He asked suddenly and felt her hand tighten on his. Does he really wait for us? in his village or will we search this country for a year and still not find him it's a thought came to me too it's, it's a thought it's a thought came to me too but i was afraid to think it aloud but hush now axel or we'll be heard indeed sir gawain and wisdom had halted on the path ahead to wait for them and appeared to be in genial com conversation as he came up to them Axel could hear Sir Gawain saying with a chuckle, I'll confess, Master Wiston, my hopes that even now Kyrick's breath will rob you of the memory of why you walk beside me. I await eagerly your asking, where is it I lead you? Yet I see from both your eye and step, you forget little. Wiston smiled. I believe, sir, this, it is this very gift to withstand the strange spell won me this errand from my king. For in defense, we have never known a creature quite like Kyrick, yet have known others with wonderful par powers, and it, no and it was noticed how little I was swayed, even as my comrades soon and wandered in dreams. I fancy this was my king's only reason to choose me, for almost all my comrades at home are better warriors than this one walks beside you now. Im Possible to believe, Master Wiston. Both report and observation tell you tell of your extraordinary qualities. You overestimate me, sir. Yesterday, needing to bring down that soldier under your gaze, I was all too aware how a man of your skill might view my small accomplishment, sufficient to defeat a frightened guardsman, but far short of your approval, I fear. What nonsense, sir! You are a splendid fellow, and no more of it. Now, friends, Gawain turned his gaze to include Axel and Beatrice. It's not so far now. Let's be moving on while she sleeps. They continued in silence. This time, Axel and Beatrice did not fall behind, for a sense of solemnity seemed to descend, that descend on Gawain and Winston, making them proceed. 
in front of an almost ceremonial pace. In any case, the ground had become less demanding, leveling to something like a plateau. The rocks they had discussed from below now loomed before them and Axel could see as they come ever nearer how they were arranged in rough semicircle around the top of a mount to the side of their path. You could see too how a small a row of smaller stones rose in a kind of stairway up the mountain in the mount, leading right up to the rim of what could only be a pit of significant depth. The grass all around where they had now arrived seemed to have blackened or burned, lending the surrounding already without tree or shrub an atmosphere of decay. Gawain bringing the party to a halt near where the crude stairway began and turned to face Winston with some deliberation. Will you not consider a last time, sir, leaving this dangerous plan? Why not return to your orphan tied to his stick? There's his voice in the wind even now. The warrior glanced back at the way they had come, then looked again at Sir Gawain. You know it, sir. I cannot turn back. Show me this dragon. The old knight nodded thoughtfully as though Winston had just made some casual but fascinating observation. Very well, friends, he said. Then keep your voices low. For what purpose should we wake her? Sir Gawain led the way up to the side of the mound and, and on, reaching the rock signal for them to wait. He then peered over carefully and after a moment beckoned to them, saying in a low voice, Come, stand along here, friends, and you'll see her well enough. Axel helped his wife onto the ledge beside him, then leaned over one of the rocks. The pit below was broader and, and shallower than he had expected, more like a drained pond than, an, than something that actually dug into the ground. The greater part of it was now in pale sun sunlight and seemed to consist of entirely of grey rock and gravel, the blackened grass finishing abruptly at the, at the rim, so that the only living thing visible, aside from the she-dragon, was a solitary ha hawthorn bush sprouting incongruously through the stone near to the center of the pit's belly. As for the she-dragon, it was hardly clear at first she was alive, her posture prone prone, head twisted to one side, limbs spread out, might easily have resulted from her corpse being hurled into the pit from a great height. In fact, it took a moment to ascertain this was a dragon at all. She was so emaciated she looked more like a worm-like reptile accustomed to water that had mistakenly come aground and was in the process of dehydrating. Her skin, which should have been should have appeared oiled and of a color not unlike bronze, was instead of a yellowing white, reminiscent of the underside of certain fish. The remnants of her wings were sagging folds of skin that careless that a careless glance might have taken for dead leaves accumulating to either side of her. The head being turned against a grey pebble, Axel could only see the one eye which was hooded in the manner of the turtles and which opened and closed lethargically according to some internal rhythm. This movement and the faintest rise and fall along the creature's backbone were the only indicators that the curic that Curic was still alive. Can this really be her, Axel? Beatrice said quietly. This poor creature is no more than a fleshy threat. Yet Look there, mistress, Sir Gawain's voice said behind them. So long as she she's breath left, she does her duty. Is she sick or perhaps already poisoned? asked Axel. She simply grows old, sir, as we all must do. But she still breathes, and so Merlin's work lingers. Now, a little of this comes back to me, Axel said. I remember Merlin's work here and dark it was too. Dark, sir, said Gawain. Why dark? It was the only way. Even before the battle was properly won, I rode out with four good comrades to tame this same creature. In those days, both mighty and angry, so Merlin could place his great spell on her breath. 
a dark man he may be may have been but in this he did god's will not only arthur's without this without this she dragon's breath would peace ever have come look how we live now sir all foes as cousins village by village master wiston you fall silent before his sight i asked again will you not leave this poor creature to live out her life her breath isn't what it was yet holds the magic even now think sir once the breath should cease, what might be awo awoken across this land even after these years? Yes, we slaughtered plenty, I admit it. Caring not who was strong and who was weak, God may not have smiled at us, but we cleansed the land of war. Leave this place, sir, I beg you. We may pray to different gods, yet surely yours will bless this dragon as does mine. Wisdom turned away from the pit to look at the old knight. What kind of god is it, sir? Wishes wrongs to go forgotten and unpunished. You ask it well, Master Wisdom, and I know my god looks east uneasily on our deeds of that day. Yet it's long past and the bones lie sheltered beneath this beneath a pleasant green carpet. The young know nothing of them. I beg I beg you leave this place and let Curic do her work a while longer another season or two that's the most she will last even yet even that may be long enough for all wounds to heal forever and an eternal peace to hold among us look how she clings to life sir be merciful and leave this place leave this country to rest in forgetfulness foolishness sir how can all wounds heal on while maggots linger so richly, or a peace hall forever built on slaughter and magician trickery? I see how devoutly you wish for your, you wish it, for your old horrors to crumble as dust, yet they await in the soil as the white bones for men to uncover. Sir Gawain, my answers unchanged. I must go down to this pit. Sir Gawain nodded gravely. I understand, sir. Then I must ask you in return, Sir Knight, will you leave this place to me and return to your fine stallion awaits you below? You know I cannot, Master Wisdom. It's as I thought. Well then. Wisdom came past Axel and Beatrice and down the rough horn steps. When he once more at the foot of the mound looked around him and said in a quite new voice, Sir Gawain, this earth looks curious here. Can it be the she, the she dragon in her most vigorous days blasted it this way? Or does lightning strike here often to burn the ground before new grasses grow, return? Gawain, who had followed him down to the mound, also come off the steps. And for a moment or two of them strode about randomly like companions pondering at which spot to pitch their tents. It's something always puzzled me too, Master Wiston, Gawain was saying. For even when younger, she remained above and I don't suppose it's Kyrick made this blasted ground. Perhaps it was always thus even when we first brought her here and lowered her into her lair. Gawain tapped his heel experimentally on the soil. A good floor, sir, nevertheless. Indeed, Wiston, his back to Gawain who was testing the ground with his boot, though perhaps a little short in width, remarked not the knight. See how the edge rolls over the cliffside. A man who fell here would rest on friendly earth. Sure enough, yet his blood may run swiftly through these burnt grasses and over that side. I don't speak for you, sir, but I will not fancy my insides dripping over the cliff like a gull's white dropping. They both laughed and then Winston said, A needless worry, sir. See how the ground lifts slightly before the cliffs here. As for the opposite edge, it's too far to the other side and plenty of thirsty soil first. That's well observed. Well then, the, it's not a bad spot. Sir Gawain looked up at Axel and Beatrice, who were still up on the ledge, though now with their backs to the pit. Master Axel, he called cheerfully. You are always the great one for diplomacy. Do you care to use your fine eloquence now to let us leave this place as friends? 
I'm sorry, Sir Gawain. You have shown us much kindness and we thank you for it. Yet, we are now here to see the end of Curic. And if you will defend her, there's nothing for I, that I or my wife can say on your side. Our wills with Master Wiston in this matter. I see it, sir. Then let me ask at least of you. I don't fear this fellow before me. Yet, if I should be the one who fall, will you take my good horrors back down this mountain? He will welcome a pair of good Britons on his pack. You may think he grumbles, but him, you will not be too much for him. Take my dear Horace far away from here, and when you have no more use of him, find him a green, f fine green meadow where he may eat his to his heart's content and think of old days. Will you do this for me, friends? We will do it gladly, sir, and your horse will be the saving of us too for its harsh journey down these hills. On that point, sir, Gawain had now come right to the foot of the mount. I urge you once before to use the river and do so again. Let Horace take you down these slopes, but once you meet the river, search for a boat to take you east. There's tin and coins in the saddle to buy your passages. We thank, we thank you, sir. Your generosity we thank you, sir. Your generosity moves us. But Sir Gawain, Beatrice said, If your horse takes the two of us, then how your fallen body to be carried down from this mountain? In your kindness, you neglect your own corpse, and will be sorry to bury you in such a lonely spot as this. For an instant, the old knight's feature becomes solemn and almost sorrowful, then decreased into a smile, and he said, Now, mistress, Let's not discuss bureau plans while I still expect to emerge victorious. In any case, this mountain is no less lonely spot for to me now than any other, and I'll fear the sight of my ghost must witness on lower ground should this contest go another way. So no more of these corpses, madam. Master Wiston, have you anything to ask of these friends should fortune not go your way? Like you, sir. I prefer not to think of defeat, yet only a mighty fool would believe you anything other than a formidable, formidable foe, no matter your years. So I too will burden this good couple with a request. If I am no more, please see to it Master Edwin reaches a kind village and let him know I considered him the worthiest of apprentices. We will do so, Axel said. We'll seek the best for him, and even though the wound he carries makes, he, makes his future a dark one. That's well said. Now I'm reminded I must do even more to survive this meeting. Well, Sir Gawain, shall we go to it? Yet, one more request, said the old knight. And this one to you, Master Wiston. I raised the matter of embarrassment, for it touches what we discussed with pleasure a moment ago, but I mean, sir, the question of drawing the sword. With my heavy years, I find it takes a foolishly long time to pull this sword out of its chest. If you and I face each other swords undrawn, I fear that I would provide you with feeble entertainment and knowing how fast you draw. Why, sir, I might still be hobbling about, muttering small curses and tucking, tugging at this iron with one grip, then another, as you take to the air, wondering if to cut off my head, or else sing an ode while waiting. Yet, if we were to agree to draw our swords in our own time, why, this embarrasses me greatly, sir. Not another word on it, Sir Gawain. I never think well of a warrior who leans on speedy draw of a blade to take advantage of his opponent. So, let's meet with sword ready drawn, just as you suggest. I thank you, sir. And in return, though I see your arm strapped, I vow not to seek special advantage of it. I'm grateful, sir, though this injury is a trivial one. Well then, sir, with your permission, the old knight drew his sword, indeed it seemed to take some time, and placed the point into the ground just as he had done earlier, at the giant's curve. But instead of leaning on it, he stood there re regarding his weapon up. 
and down with a mixture of weariness and affection. Then he took the sword in both hands and raised it, and Gawain's posture took an unmistakable grandeur. I'll turn away now, Axel, Beatrice said. Tell me when it's finished, and let it not be long and or unclean. At first, both men held their sword pointing downwards so as not to exhaust their, their arm. From his vantage point, Axel could see the position clearly at almost five strides apart. Winston's body angled slightly to the left away from his opponents. They held this position for a long time. Then Winston moved three, step, three slow steps, steps to his right so that to all appearance, his outer his outside shoulder was no longer protected by his sword, but to take advantage, Gawain would have to close the gap very rapidly, and Axel was hardly surprised when the knight gazing accusingly at the warrior himself moved to the right with deliberate strides. Winston, meanwhile, changed the grip of both of his hands on his swords, and Axel could not be sure Gawain had noticed the change. Winston Winston's body possibly obscuring the knight's view, but now Gawain too was changing his hole, letting the sword of weight fall from the right arm to the, to the left. Then, the two men became fixed in their new position, and to, a, and to an innocent spectator, they may have looked in relation to one another practically unchanged from before. Yet Axel could sense that these new positions had a different significance. It had been a long time since he had had to consider combat in such detail, and there remained a frustrating sense that he was failing to see half of what was unfolding before him. He knew, but he knew somehow the contest had reached a critical point. The things could not be held like this for a long, for long without one or the other com combatant being forced to commit himself. Even so, he was taken aback by the suddenness of which Gawain and Winston met. It was as if they had responded to a signal, the space between them vanished and the two suddenly locked in tense embrace. It happened so quickly it appeared to Axel. It happened so quickly, it appeared to Axel that the men had abandoned their sword and now holding one another in a complicated mutual arm lock. As they did so, they rotated a little like dancers and Axel could see then that the two, their two blades, perhaps because of the huge impact of their coming together, had become melded as one. Both men, mortified by this turn of events, was now doing their best to prise the weapon apart. But this was no easy task, and the old knight's features were contorted with effort. Winston's face, for a moment, was not visible, but Axel could see the warrior's neck and shoulders shaking as he too did all he could to reverse the calamity. But their efforts were in vain. With each moment, two swords seemed to fasten more thoroughly, and surely there was nothing for it but to abandon the weapon and start the contest afresh. Neither man, though, appeared willing to give up as the effort threatened to drain them from their strength. Then something gave and the blades came apart. As they did so, some dark grain, perhaps some the substance that had caused the blade to fasten together in the first place, flew into the air between them. Gawain, with a look of astonished relief, reeled away round and sank to one knee. Winston, for his part, had been carried by the momentum, momentum into turning a near circle and had come to a halt pointing his now liber liberated sword towards the clouds beyond the cliff, his back fully turned to the, to the night. God protect him, Beatrice said beside him, and Axel realized she had been watching all the time. When he, when he looked down again, Gawain had lowered his other knee to the ground, and the tall figure of the knight fell slowly, twisting on, onto the dark grass. There he struggled a moment like a man in his dark sleep, 
trying to make himself more comfortable when his face turned to the sky even though his legs were still folded untidily beneath him. Gawain seemed content as Winston approached with a concerned stride. The old knight appeared to say something, but Axel was too far to hear. The warrior remained standing. The warrior remained standing. Sorry. Uh, over his opponent for some time, his sword held forgotten at his side. Axel could see dark droppings falling from the tip of the blade onto the soil. Beatrice pressed himself herself against him. He was the she dragon's defender, she said. Yet showless kindness. Who knows where we'll be now without him, Axel? And I'm sorry to see him fallen. He pressed. He pressed Beatrice close to him, then released her. He climbed down a little way to the to where he could see better Gawain's body lying on the earth. Winston had been correct. <laughs> Winston <laughs> had been correct. The blood with the f uh sorry, <laughs> got distracted. He, he pressed Beatrice close to him, then releasing her, he climbed down a little way to where he could see better Gawain's body lying on the earth. Wisdom had been correct. The blood had, had flowed only to where the, the ground rose in a, kind of a lip, in a kind of lip at the cliff's edge and was pulling there with no danger of spilling over. The sight caused a melancholy to sweep over him, but also, though it was a distant and vague one, the feeling that was some great anger within him had at long last been answered. Bravo, sir. Bravo, sir, Axel called down. Now there's nothing stands between you and the she-dragon. Winston, who had all the while been staring down at the fallen knight, now comes slowly, somewhat giddily, to the foot of the mound, and when he looked up, appeared to be in something of a dream. I learned long ago, he said, not to fear death as I thought, yet I thought I heard his soft tread behind me as I faced this knight. Long in years, but he was so close to getting the better of me. The warrior seemed to then notice the sword still in his hand made as though to thrust into the soft earth at the foot of the mound. But at the last moment he stopped himself, the blade almost at the soil and straightening said, Why why clean this sword yet? Why not let this knight's blood mingle with the she dragons? He came out to the side of the mound, his gait still somewhat like a drunkard brushing past them and he leant and he leaned over a rock and gazed down into the pit, his shoulders moving with each breath. Master Winston, Beatrice said gently, we are now impatient to see you slay Kyrick, but will you bury this poor knight after? My husband here is weary and must save his strength for what remains of our journey. He was a kin of the hated Arthur, Winston said, turning to her. Yet I will not leave him to the crows. Rest assured, mistress, I'll see to him and e may even lay him down in this pit beside the creature he so long defended. Then hurry, sir, Beatrice said, and finish the task. For for though she is feeble, it will not be easy till we know that she is, that she is slain. But Winston seemed no longer to hear her, for he was now gazing at Axel with a faraway expression. Are you well, sir? Axel asked eventually. Master Axel, the warrior said, We may not meet again, so let me ask one last time. Could you be the gentle Briton from my boyhood, who once moved like a wise prince through our village, making men dream of ways to keep innocence beyond the reach of war? If you have remembrance of it, I ask you to confide in me before we part. If we... If I was that man, sir, I see him today only through the, the haze of this creature's breath, and he looks a fool and a dreamer, yet one meant well, and suffered to, so, to see solemn oaths undone in cruel slaughter.
there are uh, there were others spread treaty through the Saxon village. But if my face stirs something in you, why suppose it was another's? I thought it was what I thought it when we first met, sir, but couldn't be sure. I thank you for your frankness. Then speak frankly to me in turn, for its thing shifts within me since our meeting yesterday, and perhaps in truth for far longer. This man you remember, Master Wiston, is he one who of whom you would seek vengeance? What are you saying, husband? Beatrice pushed forward, placing herself between Axel and the and the warrior. What quarrel can there be when you and this uh, What quarrel can there be between you and this warrior? If there's one, he'll need to strike me first. Master Wiston talks of of a skin I shared before we two ever met, princess. One I had hoped long crumbled on forgotten paths than to wisdom. Why, what do you say, sir? Your sword still drips. If it's vengeance that you crave, it's a thing easily found, though I beg you protect my dear wife who trembles for me. That man was one I once adored from afar, but it's true. There were times later I wish him cruelly punished for his part in the betrayal, yet I see today he may have acted with no cunning, wishing well for his own kin and ours alike. If I met him again, sir, I would bid him to go in peace, even though I know peace now can hold, can't hold for long. But excuse me, friends, and let me go down and end my errand. Down in the pit, neither the dragon's position nor posture had changed. If her senses were warning her of proximity of strangers and one in particular making his way down the steep of the mountain, Curie gave no indication of it. Or could it be the rise or fall of her spine had become so more pronounced? And was there a new urgency in the hooded eye as it opened and shut? Axel could not be sure. But he continued to gaze down at the, at the creature. The idea came to him that the ho that the hawthorn bush, bush, the only other thing alive in the pit, had become a source of great comfort to her, and even now in her mind's eye she was reaching for it. Axel realized the, the idea of fanciful. The idea was fanciful. Yet the more he watched, the more credible it seemed. For how long it was it a solitary bush was growing in a place like this? Could it? not be that Merlin, Merlin himself had, uh, had allowed it to grow there so that the dragon would have a companion. Winston was growing, was continuing his descent, his sword still unsheathed, his gaze rarely stayed straight from the spot where the creature lay, as if he half expected her to rise suddenly, transform into a formidable foe. At one stage, he slipped and dug his sword into the ground to avoid sliding some way down on his backside. This episode sent stones and gravel cascading down the slope, but Curic still gave no response. Then Winston was safely on the ground. He wiped his forehead, glanced up at Axel and Beatrice, then moved towards the she-dragon, stopping several strides away. Then he raised his sword and began to scrutinize the blade. Apparently. Taken aback to discover its its streak of blood, for several moments Winston remained like this, not moving. So that Axel wondered if the strange mood that had overtaken the warrior since his victory had momentarily made him for forget his reason for entering the pit. But then, with something of an unexpectedness that had that had characterized his contest with the old knight, Winston suddenly moved forward. He did not return. He did, he did not run. But walked briskly, stepping over the dragon's body without breaking a stride, and hurried as though anxious to reach the other side of the pit. But his sword had had described a swift, low arc in in pa in passing, and Axel saw the dragon's head spin into the air and roll a little way before coming to a rest on the stony ground. It did not remain there for long, however, for. It was soon engulfed by the rich tide that first parted around it, then buoy, 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 he bu buoyed it up till it swam glidingly across the floor of the pit. It came to a stop at the hawthorn, then it lodged the throat 
up to the sky. The sight brought back to Axel the head of the monster dog Gawain had severed in the tunnel, and again a melancholy threatened to sweep over him. He made himself look away from the dragon and watched instead the figure of Wisdom, who had not stopped walking. The warrior was now circling back, avoiding the ever-spreading pool, then his sword still unsh unsheathed began to climb out of the pit. It's done, Axel, Beatrice said. It is, princess. Yet, there's still a question I wish to ask this warrior. A short break. Winston took a surprisingly long climb to, to climb out of the pit. When at last he appeared before them again, looked overwhelmed and not in the least triumphant, without a word he sat down on the blackened ground right on the rim of the, of the pit and at last thrust his sword deep into the earth. Then he gazed emptily and not into the pit but beyond at the clouds and the pale hills in the distance. After a moment, Beatrice went over to him and touched his arms gently. We thank you for this deed, Master Winston, she said, and there will be many more across the land would thank you if they were here. Why look so despondent? Despondent? No matter. I, I will regain my spirit soon, mistress. Yet, just at this moment, Winston turned away from Beatrice and once more gazed at the clouds. Then he said, Perhaps I've been I've been too long among you Britons, despised the cowardly among you, admired and loved the best of you, and all from a tender age. And now I sit here shaking, f not for, from weariness, but at the th very thought of what my own hands have done. I must soon steal my heart or be, f be a frail warrior for my king in what's to come. What is this you speak of, sir? Beatrice asked. What further task awaits of you now? As justice and vengeance await, mistress, and they will soon hurry this way, for both are much delayed. Yet now, the hour's almost upon us, I find my heart trembles like a maid's. It can only be that I have been too long among you. I didn't fail to notice, sir, Axel said. Your earlier remark to me, you said that you wished me to go in peace, yet the peace couldn't hold much longer. I wondered, then, what you meant by it, even as you descended into this pit. Will you explain yourself to us now? I see you begin to understand, Master Axel. My king sent me to destroy this she-dragon, not simply to build a monument to, to kin slain long ago. You begin to see, sir. This dragon died to make ready the way for the upcoming conquest. Conquest? Axel moved closer to him. How can this be, Master Wisdom? Are you, are your Saxon army so swelled by your cousins from overseas? Or is it that your warriors are so fierce you talk of conquest in lands well held in peace? It is true your armies are, are yet meager in numbers yet in the Fenlands, yet Sorry, it's true. Our armies are yet meager in numbers, even in the Fenlands. Yet look across this whole land. In every valley, every beside every river, you will find a Saxon communities, and which and each with strong men and growing boys is from this will swell our ranks even as we come sweeping westward. Surely you speak in the confusion of your victory, Master Winston, Beatrice said. How can this be? You see yourself in these parts, it's your, it's your kin and mine mingle village by village. Who among them would turn on neighbors loved since childhood? Yet see your husband's face, mistress. He begins to understand why I sit here before a light too fierce for my gaze. Right enough, princess, the warrior's words make me tremble. You and I long for Curic's end. Thinking only our own dear memories, yet 
Who knows what old hatreds will, will loosen across the land now. We must hope God yet finds a way to preserve these bonds between our people, yet custom and suspicion have always divided us. Always divided us. Who knows what will come when quick-tongued men make ancient grievances rhyme with fresh desire for land and con conquest. How right to fear it, sir, Winston said. The giant, once well buried, now stirs. When he soon rises, as surely he will, the friendly bonds between us will prove as not young girls make with the stems of small flowers. Men will burn their neighbors' houses by night, hang children by hang children from trees at dawn, rivers with stink of corpse bloated from their days of voyaging, and even as they move on our armies will grow larger, swollen by anger and thirst for vengeance. For you, Britons, it will be as a ball of fire rolls towards you. You will flee or perish and country by country this pl this will become a new land, a Saxon land, and with no more trace of your people's time here than a flock or two of sheep wandering the hills unattended. Can he be right, Axel? Surely he speaks in a fever? He may yet be mistaken, princess, but this is no fever. The she-dragons no more, and Arthur's shadow will fade with her. Then to wisdom, he said. I am comforted at least, sir, to find you take no delight in these horrors you paint. I would take delight if I could, Master Winston, uh, Master, sorry, Master Axel, for it will be vengeance just, justly served. Yet I am enfeebled for my years, by my years among you, and try as I will, a part of me turns from the flame of hatred. Its weakness shames me. Yet I will soon offer in my place one train by my own hand, one with a will far cleaner than mine. You speak of Master Edwin, sir? I do, and I dare say he will be growing quickly more calm now that the dark dragon slain and her pool gone from him. That boy has true warrior spirit given only to few. The rest he will learn fun fast enough and I will train his heart well enough well to admit no soft sentiments as, has, as have invaded mine. He will show you no mercy in our work ahead. Master Winston, Master Winston, Beatrice said, I still don't know if you speak only in mad fever, but my husband and I grow weak and must return to lower ground and shelter. Will you remember your promise to bury well the gentle knight? I promise to do so, mistress, though I fear even now the birds will find him. Good friends, forewarn as you are, you have enough time to escape. Take the knight's horse and ride as fast from these parts. Seek your son, your son's village if you must, but linger there no more than a day or two, for who knows how soon the flames will be lit before our coming armies. If your son will not hear your warnings, leave him and flee as far west as you can. You may yet keep ahead of the slaughter. Go now! and find the knight's horse, and you should find Master Edwin much calm, and his strange fever pass, cut him free, and beat him to come up here to me. A fierce future now falls, now opens before him, and it's my wish he sees this place, the fallen knight, and the broken she-dragon, all before this, his next steps. Bef besides, I recall how well he digs a grave with the stray stone one or two. Now hurry away, gentle friends. Farewell. That was chapter 15. Uh, and we only have one more chapter to go. And that's it. We are finishing this book. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Chapter six, sixteen. Chapter, chapter sixteen. Okay, we're ending. We are now currently ending 
the Buried Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro, part 4, chapter 16, the last chapter. Chapter 16 For some time now, the goat had been trampling the grass very near at Wind's head. Why did the animal have to come so close? They might be tied to the same post, but surely there was territory enough for, to, for each of them. He might have got up and chased the goat away, but Edwin felt too tired. The exhaustion had swept over him a little earlier, and with such intensity he had that he had fallen for that he, that he had fallen forward onto the ground, and the mountain grass pressing against his cheek, he had reached the, the edges of his sleep, but then had been startled back to wakefulness by the sudden conviction that his mother had gone. reached the edges of sleep but then had been startled back to wakefulness by the sudden conviction that his mother had gone. He had not moved and had kept his eyes closed and he had muttered aloud into the ground. Mother, we are coming. Only a little longer now. There had been no answer and he had felt a great emptiness opening within him. Since then, drifting between sleep and waking, he had several more times called to her to be answered only by silence, and now the goat was chewing the grass ne next to his ear. Forgive me, mother, he said softly into the earth. They tied me. I couldn't get free. There were voices above him. Only then did it occur to him the footsteps around him were not those of the goats, but someone was untying his hands and the rope was pulling him from under him pulling him away pulling away from under him the gentle hand raised his head and he opened his eyes to see the old woman mrs beatrice peering down at him he realized he was no longer tied and rose to his feet one of his knees were ache bakely ache badly bakely jesus christ one of his knees ache badly but when a gust of wind rocked him, he was unable. He was able to keep his balance. He looked about him. There was a grey sky, the rising land, the rocks on the crest of the next hill. Not long ago, those rocks had meant everything to him, but now she was gone. Of that, there were no doubt. There was no doubt, and he remembered something that the warrior had said: that when it was too late for rescue, it was still early for enough for revenge. If that was true. Those who had taken his mother would pay a terrible price. There was no sign of wisdom. It was just the old couple, but, the, but Edwin felt comforted by their presence. They were standing before him, gazing at him with concern, and the sight of the kindly mistress Beatrice made him feel suddenly close to tears. But Edwin realized she was saying something, something about wisdom, and made an effort to listen. Her Saxon was hard to understand and the wind seemed to carry her words away. In the end, he cut across, to, across her to ask, Is Master Wiston fallen? She fell silent but did not reply, only when he repeated himself in a voice and rose above the wind, did Mistress Beatrice shake her head empathetically and said, Don't you hear me, Master Edwin? I tell you, Master, Edwin, Master Wiston is well and awaits you at the top of the path. The news filled him with relief and he broke into a run, and then a giddiness quickly overtook and obliging him to stop before he had even reached the path. He steadied himself, glancing back, saw the old couple had taken a few steps into his direction. Edwin noticed how frail they seemed. There they, they were, standing together in the wind, each leaning against each other, l looking far looking far older than when he had first met them. Did, did they have strength left to descend the mountainside? But now they were gazing at him with such odd expression, and behind him the goat too had ceased in restless activity to stare at him. A strange thought went through Edwin's mind that he was at that moment covered his head 
to toe in blood and this was why he had become the object of such scrutiny but when he glanced down though, though his clothes were marked with mud and grass, and grass he, he saw nothing unusual the old man suddenly called out some called out something it was in Britain's tongue and Edwin could not understand was it a warning a request then Mrs. Beatrice's voice came through the wind Master Edwin we both beg this of you in days to come remember us remember us and this friendship when you were still a boy as he heard this something else came back to Edwin a promise made to the warrior a duty to hate all Britons but surely Winston had not meant to include this to include this gentle couple and now here he was master axel raising a hand uncertainly into the air was it in farewell or an attempt to detain him edwin turned away and this time he ran even with the wind pushing from one side his body did not fail him his mother was gone most likely gone beyond all retrieving but the warrior was well and waiting for him he continued to run even as the path grew steeper and ache and the ache in his knee grew worse. Okay. Uh, my apologies, that was actually chapter 17. <laughs> that was chapter 16. Very, very short. Uh, the end is chapter 17. I think. I don't think there's chapter 18. Okay, let's do it. Chapter 17. came riding through the, the rainstorm, I shouted under the pines, no weather, for a pair so long in years, and a sagging horse no less weary, does the old man fear for the animal's heart with one more step, why else halt in the mud with twenty paces still to the nearest tree, yet the horse stand with patience under the downpour as the, ma as the old man lifts her down, could they performed the task more slowly were they painted figures in the picture come friends i call to them hurry and take shelter neither hears me perhaps it's the hiss of the rain or is is it their old age seals their ears i call again and now the old man looks about him and sees me at last finally he slides she, she slides down into his arms and though she is but a thin sparrow but i see i see he has barely strength left to hold her. So I leave my shelter and the old man turned in alarm to see me splash across the grass. But he accepts my, my assistance. For wasn't he about to, th to sink to the earth, his good wife arm still circling his neck. I take her from him, hurry back to the trees. She's, she, no burden, she no burden to me at all. I hear the old man panting at my heels perhaps he fears for his wife in the arms of a stranger so i set her down with care to show i mean only friendship i place my her head against the soft bark and well sheltered above even if a drop or two still falls around her the old man crouches beside her speaking words of encouragement and i move away wish not wishing to intrude on their intimacy i stand again at my old spot where the trees meet the open ground and watch the rain sweep across the moorland who could blame me sheltering from the rain like this i will easily make up my time on my journey but and and be all the better for the weeks of unbroken toil to come i hear them talk at my back yet what am i to do stepping into the step into the rain to beyond their murmurings it's not just the fever talking princess no no axel she says it comes back to me something more how did we ever forget our son lives on an island an island seen from a sheltered cove and surely near us now how can that be princess don't you hear it axel i can hear it even now isn't that the sea near us just the rain princess or maybe a river we forgot it, Axel, with the mist over us, but now it starts to clear. There's an island near, and our son waits there. Axel, don't you hear the sea? 
Just your fever, princess. We'll find a shelter soon and you'll be fine again. Ask this stranger, Axel. He knows this country better than us. And if there's not a cove nearby, he's just a kind man. Came to our aid, princess. Why should he have any special wisdom on such a thing? Ask him, Axel. What harm can it done? Do I remain silent? What am I to do? I turn and say, The good lady is right, sir. The old man starts, and there's fear in his eyes. A part of me wishes to fall silent again to turn away and watch the whole old horse standing steadfast in the rain. Yet now I have spoken and I must go on. I point beyond the spot where they huddled. A path there, between those trees, leads down to a cove, such as the one the lady speaks of. For the most part of the for for the most part covered in shingles, though when the tide's low, as it will be now, the pebbles give way to sand, and as you say, good lady, there's an island a little way out to the sea. They watch me in silence, she with weary happiness, he with mounting fear. Will they not say anything? Do they expect me to tell more? I've watched the sky. I say, this rain will clear shortly and the evening will be a fine one. So if you wish me to row you over to the island, I'll be pleased to do so. Didn't, you, didn't I tell you, Axel? Are you then a boatman, sir? The, the old man asked solemnly. And can it be we met somewhere before? I'm a boatman, sure enough, I tell him. It's more than I can remember if we met before, but I'm obliged to ferry to so many and for and for long hours each day the old man looks more fearful than ever holds his wife closely as he crouches beside her judging it best to change the, the to change the topic i say your horse still stands in the rain even though he's untethered and nothing stops him seeking the nearby tree he's an old battle horse sir the old man said happy to leave talk of the cove speaks of quick eagerness he keeps his discipline even though his master's no more we must see to him in time the way we lately prom promised his brave owner but just now i worry for my dear wife do you know where we may find shelter sir or fire to warm her i cannot lie and i have my duty as it happens i reply there's a small shelter found on this very cove. It's one I stitched myself, a small roof of twigs and rags. I left the fire smoldering beside this last hour. It will not be beyond reviving. He hesitates, searching for my face carefully. The old woman's eyes are now closed and her eyes rested on his shoulder. He says, Boatman, my wife spoke just now in a fever. We have no need of islands. Better we shelter beneath those these friendly trees till the rain is gone, then we'll journey on our way. Axel, where are you saying? The woman says, opening her eyes. Hasn't our son waited long enough? Let this good boatman lead us to the cove. The old man hesitates still, but feels his wife shiver in his arms, and his eyes look to me with desperate entreaty. If you wish, I say. I carry the good lady and make the way to the cove easier. I'll carry him myself, sir, he says, like one defeated what like like one defeated yet defiant. If she's not able to go by on her own then she'll go in my arms. What to say to this? The husband now almost as weak as the wife. The cove's not far, I say I say gently. But the way down steep, with pits and twisted roots, please allow me to carry her, sir. It's the safest thing. You walk close with us, beside us where the, where the way allows. Come, when the rain eases, we'll hurry down and, and for, foresee how the good lady trembles for cold. The rain stopped before long and I carried her down to the hill path and the old man stumbling behind. When we came about out to the beach, the dark clouds were swept to one side of the sky as if by impatient hands the reddish hues of the evening opened it, so reddish hues of the evening all across the shore, a foggy sun falling towards the sea and my boat rocking out in the waves. 
With another show of gentleness, I laid her down under the root cover of dried skins and branches, placing her head against a cushion of mossy rock. He came. He comes fussing about her even before I can step away. See there, I say, and crouch beside the slumbering fire. That's the island. Only a small turn of the head gives a woman a view of the sea, and she laughs out a soft cry. He must turn on the hard pebbles and stare bewildered there, here and there at the waves. There, friend, I say, look there, midway between the shore and the horizon. My eyes aren't so good, he says, but yes, I believe I see it now. Are those the tops of trees or jagged rocks? They'll be trees, friend, for it's a gentle place. I say, I say this all the while breaking twigs and, attend and attending to the fire. They both look out to the island and then I kneel down and the pebbles harsh against my bones to blow at the embers. The man, this man and woman, did they not come of their own will? Let them decide their own paths, I say to myself. Do you feel the warmth now, princess? He cries. You'll soon be yourself again. I see the island, Axel she says, and how can I but intrude upon this intimacy? That's where our son waits. So strange how we ever forgot such a thing. He mumbles a reply, and I, s and I see he grows troubled again. Surely, princess, he said, we're not yet decided. Do we really want to cross, su cross to such a place? Besides, we have no way to pay our passage, for we left the tin and coins with the horse. Am I to remain silent? That's no matter, friend, I say. I'll gladly to take what's owed later from the saddle. That steed won't wander far. Some may call this cunning, but I spoke from simple charity, knowing well I would never come upon the horse again. They talk gently. They talk in gentle, gentle voices, and I kept my back on to them, attending to the fire. For do I wish to intrude on them? Yet she lifts her voice and one more steady than, steady than before. Boatman, she says, that's a tale I once heard, perhaps as a small child of an island full of gentle woods and streams, yet also a place was of strange qualities. Many cross to it, yet for each who dwells there, it's as if he walks to the island alone, his neighbors unseen and unheard. Can this be true of the island now before us? I go on breaking twigs and placing them carefully about the flame. Good lady, I know several islands to fit such a description. Who knows if this one is among them? An evasive answer and one to give her bonus. I also, I also heard, boatman, she says. There are times when these strange conditions cease to prevail of special dispense dispensations granted certain travelers did i hear it right sir dear lady i say i'm just a humble boatman it's not for me to talk of such matters but since there's no one else here let me offer this i heard it said there may, may be certain times perhaps during a storm such as the one just passed or the summer's night when the moon's full an islander may get a sense of others moving beside him in the wind this may be what you once heard good lady no boatman she says it was something more i heard that it is said a man and a woman after a lifetime shared with a with a bond of love unusually strong may travel to the island no need to roam it apart I hear I heard they may enjoy the pleasures of one another's company as they did all the years before. Could this be a true thing I heard, boatman? I'll say it again, good lady, I'm just a boatman, charged with ferrying of those who wish to cross the water. I could only speak of what I observed in my daily toil. Yet there is no one here now but but you to guide us, boatman. So I ask this of you, sir, if you now ferry my husband and me, can it be we'll not be parted, but free to walk to the island arm in arm the way we are now? Very well, good lady. I will speak to you frankly. You and your husband are a pair, as we both men rarely set eye upon. I saw you. I saw your unusual devotion to each other, even as you came riding through the rain. 
so there's no question that you'll be permitted to dwell on the island together, be assured on that point. What you say fills me with happiness, boatman, she says, and appeared to sag in relief. Then she says, and who knows? During a storm or a calm moonlit night, Axel and I may glimpse our son close by, even speak with him a word or two. The fire now burning steadily, I rise to my feet. See, see there, I say, pointing out to the sea. The boat stirs in the boat stirs in shallow in shallows, but I keep my oar hidden in the nearby cave, deep in in a rope in a rock pool where tiny fishes tiny fish circles. Friends, I'll go now to fetch it. And when I'm gone, you may talk here between you unhindered by my presence. Let's have you come to your decision once and for all if this is a voyage you wish to make. Now I'll leave you a moment. But she will not release me so easily. One word before you go, boatman, she says. Tell us if you return before you consent to ferry us, you intend to question us in return, for I have heard this was the way among the boatmen to discover those rare ones to fit to walk in the island un unseparated. They both gaze at me, the evening light upon their faces, and I see his, his filled with suspicions. I meet her eyes, not his. Good lady, I said. I am grateful for this reminder. In my haste, I may easily have neglected what I am bound to cast by custom to do. It's as you say, yet in this case only for the sake of tradition. For I said, for as I said, I saw from the from the first how you were you were a pair tied by an extraordinary devotion. Now excuse me, my friends, I, for my time grows short. Have your decision. For my return. So I left them then and walked across the evening shore till the waves grew loud and pebbles turned underfoot to wet sand. Whenever I look up, look back at them, I saw the same sight, each, each time a little smaller. The grey woman crouched in solemn co conference before his woman. Of her, I could see a little for the rock she, le she leaned on hid all but the rise and fall of a hand as she spoke a devoted couple but I, but I had my duty and i went on to the cave and the oar when i came back to them my oar the oar on my shoulder i could see their decision in their eye before he said we ask you to take us to the island boatman then let's hasten to the boat for i am already much delayed i said and move away as though to hurry towards the waves but then i turned back saying ah wait we must first go through this foolish ritual then friends let me propose this good sir if you rise now and walk a little way be away from a little way from us once you're out of hearing i'll speak briefly with your gentle wife she she, she need not stir from where she is she sits then in time, I'll come to you whenever, wherever you stand, and we'll soon be done and return to fetch this good lady to the boat. He stares at me. A part of him now longing to trust me, he says at last. Very well, boatman. I'll wonder a moment about this shore. Then to this woman. We'll be parted but an instant, princess. There's no concern, Axel, she says. I'm much restored and safe under this kind man's protection. Away he goes, walking slowly to the east of the coast of the cove and great shadow of the cliff. The birds scatter before him but quickly return to peck as as before at the seaweed and rock. He limps slightly, his back bent like one close to defeat. Yet I still see some small fire within him. The woman sits before me looking up with a, with a soft smile. What am I to ask? Don't fear my questions, good lady, I say. I would wish now for a long wall nearby to which to turn my face even as I speak to her, but there's only the evening breeze and the low sun on my face. I crouch before her and I saw her husband do, pulling my robe to my knees. 
I don't fear your questions, boatman, she says quietly. For I know what I feel in my heart for him. Ask me what you will, my answers will be honest, yet prove only one thing. I ask a question or two, the usual questions, for have I not done this often enough? Then, every now and then, to encourage her and to show that I attend, I ask another. But there's hardly the need, for she speaks freely, she talks on, her eyes sometimes closing, her voice always clear and steady, and I listen with care, as is my duty, even as my gaze goes across the cove to the figure of the tired old man pacing anxiously among the small rocks. Then, remembering the work awaiting me elsewhere, I break into her recollections and say, I thank you, good lady. Let me now hurry to your good husband. Surely he begins to trust me now, for why else wander so far from his wife? He hears my footsteps and turns as, uh, as from a dream. The evening glow upon him. I, can, I could see his face no longer filled with suspicions. But a deep sorrow and a small and small tears in his eyes. How goes it, sir? He asked quietly. A pleasure, a pleasure to listen to your good lady. I reply, matching my voice to his soft tone. Though the wind grows unruly, but now, friend, let's be brief. We can be on our way. Ask what you will, sir. I have no searching question, friend. But your good wife just now recalled a day or two of you carried eggs back from the market. She said that she held them in the basket before her and you walked beside her, peering into the basket all the way for, for fear she steps. her steps would injure the, the eggs. She recalled all the time with happiness. I think I do too, boatman, he said and looks at me with a smile. I was anxious for the eggs because she, she would stumble on the previous er errand, breaking one or two, a small walk, but we are all contented that day. It's as she remembers it, I say. Well then, let's waste no more time, for this talk was only to satisfy custom. Let's go fetch the old lady, to, uh, the good lady, and carry her to the boat. And I begin to lead the way back to the shelter and his wife, but now he goes at a dreary prey dreary pace slowing me with him don't be afraid of the waves friend i say thinking here's the source of his worry the estuary well is well protected and no harm can come between here and the island i readily trust your judgment boatman friend as it happens i say for why not fill this slow journey with a little more talk there was a question i might have asked just now had we have more time since we walked together this way would you mind telling me what it was not at all boatman i was simply going to ask was there some remembrance from your years together still brought you particular pain that that's all it was do you do we still speak as part of the questioning sir oh no i say that's over and finished i asked the same of your good wife earlier so it so it was merely to satisfy my own curiosity. Remain silent on it, friend. I take no offense. Look there. I point to a rock. We are passing. Those aren't barnacles. With more time, I would show how to prize them from the rock side to make them to make a handy supper. I've often toasted them over fire. Boatman, he says gravely, and his steps slows further still. I'll answer your question if you wish. I can't be certain how she answered it, for there's much help in silence even between those like us. What's more, even this day, a, a she-dragon's breath polluted the air, robbing memories both happy and dark, but the dragon is slain, and already many things grow clearer in my mind. You ask, for a memory brings particular pain. What else can I say, boatman? Then it's of our son, almost grown when we last saw him, but who left us before a beard was on his face. It was after some time of a quarrel, only to a nearby village. I thought it was a matter of days that he would return. Your wife spoke of the same friend. I 
and tell him and she said she's to blame for his leaving if she convicts herself for the first part of it there's plenty to lay at my door for the next for it's true there was a small moment she was unfaithful to me it may be both men I did something to drive her to the arms of the of another or was it what I failed to say or do it's all distant now like a bird flown by and become a speck in the sky but our son was witness to his bitterness and at an age too old to be fooled with soft words yet too young to know the many strange ways of our hearts he left vowing never to return and was still for away from us and and was still away from us when she and I were happily reunited. This part your wife told me, and how soon after came news of your good son taken by the plague swept the country. My own parents were lost in the same plague, friend, and I remember it well. But why blame yourself for it? A plague sent by God or the devil? But what fault lies with, with you for it? I forbade her to go to his grave, Boatman, a cruel thing. She wished us to go together to where he rested, but I wouldn't have it. Now many years have passed, and it's only a few days ago we set off to find it, and by then the she-dragon's mist had robbed us of any clear knowledge of what we sought. Ah, uh, so that's it, I say. That part your wife was shy to reveal. So it was you who stopped her from visiting his grave. A cruel thing I did, sir. And a darker betrayal than the small inf infidelity cock told me a month or two. What did you hope to gain, sir? Preventing not just your wife, but even yourself grieving at your son's resting place. Gain? There is nothing to gain, boatman. It was a foolish... It was just foolishness and pride, and whatever lurks in the depth of a, of a man's heart. And perhaps it was a craving to punish, sir. I spoke and I acted forgiveness. I spoke and acted forgiveness, yet kept locked through long years some small chamber in my heart that yearned for vengeance. A small, a petty and black thing I did to her and my son too. I thank you for for, confide, for confiding this friend i say to him and perhaps it's as well for though this talk intrudes intrudes in no part on my duty and we speak now as two companions passing the day i confess there was before a small unease in my mind a feeling i had yet to hear all there was now i'll be able to roll you with a carefree contentment but tell me my friend what is it you, what is it made you break the resolve of so many years and come out at last on this journey was it something said or a change of heart unknowable of the tide and sky bef before us i've wondered myself boatman and i think now it's no single thing changed my heart but it but it was gradually won back by the years shed between us that may be all it was boatman a wound that healed slowly but heal it did for there was a morning, not long ago, the dawn brought with its first sight of this spring, and I watched my wife still asleep through the sun, already lit our chamber, and I knew the last of the darkness had left me. So we came on this journey, sir, and now my wife recalls our son crossing before us to this island, so his burial place must be within its woods and perhaps on its gentle shores. Boatman. I spoken honestly to you, and I hope it doesn't cast your earlier judgment of us in doubt, for I suppose there's some would hear my words and think our love flawed and broken, but God will know the slow thread of an old couple's love for each other and understand how black shadows make part of its whole. Don't worry, friend. What you told me merely echoes what I saw when you and your wife first came through the rain on that weary steed. Well, sir, no more talk, for who knows if another, if another storm will come, on, will come our way. Let's hurry to her and carry her to the boat. She sits asleep at the rock with a look of contentment, the fire smoking beside her.
I'll carry her myself this time, boatman, he says. I feel my strength restored in me. Can I allow this? It will make my task no easier. These pebbles make hard walking, sir, friend, I say. What will, the, what will be the cost of your t stumbling as you carry her? I'm well used to the work, for she will not be the first need to carry into the boat. You can walk beside us, talking to her as you wish. Let it be like she was carried those eggs and, and you went anxiously beside her. The fear returned to his face, yet he replies quietly. Very well, boatman. Let's do as you say. He walks at my side, muttering encouragement to her. Do I strike too swiftly? For now he lags behind, and I carry her into the sea. I feel his his hand grabs desperately at my back. Yet, this is no place to loiter, for my feet must discover the, the, the key where it hides beneath the chilly water surface I step onto the stones and lapping, gra lapping waves grow shallow again and I enter the boat hardly tilting enough I carry her in my arms my rugs on the stern wet my rugs near the stern wet from the rain I kick away the soak early layers and lay her down gently I leave her sitting up her head just beneath the gunwale and and search the chest for dry blankets against the sea wind. I feel him climb into the boat even as I wrap her and the boat rocks with his with his with his tread. Friend, I say, you see the water grows more restless and this is but a small vessel. I daren't carry more than one passenger at a time. I see the fire in him well enough for it blazes through his eyes. I thought it well understood, Boatman, he says. My wife and I would cross the island unseparated. Didn't you say so repeatedly that this purpose of your question? Please don't misunderstand, friend, I say. I, I speak only of the practical matter of crossing this water. It's beyond question of the two of you will dwell on this island together, going arm in arm as you always have done. And if your son's burial place is found in some shaded spot, you may think of placing a wildflower about it, such as you growing, such as you find growing around the island. There'll be bell heather, even marigold in the wood in the woodland. Yet for this crossing, I ask you to wait a little back on the shore. I'll see to it, good ladies, comfortable on the opposite side. For I know a spot close to this boat's landing where three ancient rocks face another like old companions. I'll leave her there well sheltered, yet with a view of the waves, hasten to fetch you. But leave us for now and wait on the shore a moment longer. The red glow of the sunset on him, or is it the fire in his gaze? I will not step off this boat, sir, while my wife sits within it. Row us together, as you promised, or must I row myself? I hold the oar, sir, and it re remains my duty to pr pronounce how many rights, how many may ride in this vessel. Can it be, despite your recent friendship, you suspect some foul trickery? Do you fear I will not return to you? I accuse you of nothing, sir, yet rumors abound abound of boatmen and their ways i means no offense to you but beg you to take us both now and no more dallying boatman comes a voice and i turn in time to see her hand reach at the empty air though as though to find me there though her eyes remain closed boatman leave us a moment let my husband and i speak a, a while dare i leave the boat to them Yet surely she now speaks for me, the oar firm in my hand, and I step him, step past him over the board, in, and into the water. The sea rises to my knee, soaking hem of my rope, the vessel well tied, and I have the oar. What mischief can come of it? Still, I dare not wait. I dare not wait too far, and though I look to the shore and remain as still as a rock, I find, I find I again intrude. On their intimacy, I hear over the quiet lapping waves. Has he left us, Axel? He stands in the water, princess. He was reluctant to leave the boat, and I and I was, and I, I had said that he would not give us long. Axel, 
This is no time to quarrel with the boatman. We have great fortune coming upon him today. A boatman who looks so favorably on us. Yet, we have heard of these sly tricks. Isn't that so, princess? I trust him, Axel. He'll keep his word. How can you be so sure, princess? I know it, Axel. He's a good man and won't let us down. Do as he says and wait for him on the land. He'll come back for you soon enough. Let's do it this way, Axel, for I fear we'll lose the great dis dispensional offered to us. We are promised our time together on an island as only a few can be, even among those entwined a lifetime. Why risk such a price for a few moments of waiting? Don't quarrel with him, or else, who knows, next time we'll face some brute of a man. Axel, please make your peace with him. Even now, I fear he grows angry and changes his mind. Axel, are you still standing there? I'm still before you, princess. Can it, be, can it really be we're talking of going our way separately? It's only for a moment or two, husband. Why, what does he do now? Still standing. And moving, showing only his tall back and shining head to us. Princess, do you really believe we can trust this man? I do, Axel. Your talk with him just now, did it go happily? It went happily, husband. Wasn't it the same for you? I suppose it was. The sun sets on the cove, silence at my back. Dare I turn to them yet? Tell me, princess. I hear him say. Are you glad that the mist fading? It may bring horrors to this land, yet for us it fades just in time. I was just wondering, princess, could it be our love would never have grown so strong down the years had the mist not robbed us the way it did? Perhaps it allowed all wounds to heal. What does it matter now, Axel? Mend your friendship with the boatman and let him ferry us over. It's one of us. He'll roll, then the other. Why quarrel with him, Axel? What do you say? Very well, princess. I'll do as you say. So leave me now and return to the shore. I'll do so, princess. Then why do you still linger, husband? Do you think the boatman never grow impatient? Very well, princess. But let me just hold you once more. Do they embrace now even though I left her swaddled like a babe? Even though he must kneel and make a strange shape on the bo boat's hard floor, I suppose they do, and for as long as the silence remains and dare not return, the oar in my arm does it cast a shadow in this swaying water. How much longer? At last their voices return. We'll talk more on the island, princess, he says. We'll do that, Axel. And with the mist gone, we'll have plenty to talk of. Does the boatman still stand in the water? He does, princess. I'll go now and make my peace with him. Farewell then, Axel. Farewell, my one true love. I hear him coming through the water. Does he intend a word for me? He spoke of mending our friendship, yet when I turn, he does not look my way, only to the land and low sun on the cove, and neither do I search for his eyes. He waits on past me, not glancing back. Wait for me on the shore, friend, I say quietly, but he does not hear, and he waits on. And that is the end of the buried giant. We have finished uh, the buried giant. What is this ending? Sorry. Hell yeah, we did it. Yeah, we did. What do you think? Do you think? Do you think? He... Just 
open ending. Do you? Do you think the boatman will go back to fetch him? Do you think he will still be there when the boatman comes back? Switch off the party finder by the way. It's done. We we are we are finished. <laughs> There's not a lot of people though. Well I don't know. The way they describe the island the way they describe the island it does seem like Supernatural. Hey, good morning, Dimitri. We have just finished the reading for uh, the buried giant. Uh, <laughs> you came in just when I finished. Um, yeah, yeah. I know. Like. seems like the island that they are describing is like kind of like supernatural and I'm um, and, and um, like I'm not sure so basically this couple Axel and Axel is a um, ex soldier who a uh, knight of some sort um, but I think um, what I understand, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that so this couple, Axel and Beatrice, they live in like a they live in a small Britain village, uh, underground. So they barely have any sunlight. Um, but they were not allowed like candle at night for some reason by the elders. So the elders like don't let them have candles. For something that they have done, but they cannot remember because of the fog, of the mist, uh, of the dragon's breath. Um, so Axel forgets the part, the the, the the fact that he was an ex knight, uh, a very very good knight. Uh, uh, with that, um, he forgot about that. Uh, they, he forgot the both of them like kind of like don't remember much of their relationship except they do, that they love each other. So it was revealed in this last couple of chapter it was that she cheated on him with two like in with someone for about like a couple of months and they have a son and the son was like quite clearly know what's happening and got so angry that he he left them to another to a nearby village. And then after that, he died of uh, a plague. And then, uh, because he because he died in that village, so his uh, his uh, tombstone is at that village. Um, and the wife Beatrice wants to go visit, like, pay basically, like you know, go visit the, the her son's tomb tombstone. Uh, but he doesn't allow it uh, because. Even though he forgave her for her cheating, uh, and acted like you know, like he's okay with everything, yeah, he, like he he's disallowing her to see their son's grave, 
is a kind of a punishment towards her, like inside inside his like it like what he feels, that's what he feels. Like even though I forgave her but I still punish her kind of thing. And this mystical island that that, that appeared in a few topics, a few like chapters, a few parts ago, is that it's an island that like always have a boatman there to question you uh, whether like basically people who always go to the island are like a couple and and they could what was being what was being relayed to Beatrice uh, by this one of this widow this very very like old widow was that uh, oh shit sorry <laughs> there's a, a tarot card okay I'll, I'll get back to you after I do this finish talking about this so what was being relayed to Beatrice is that um, th- there was this, o- this this widow told her that she and her husband wants to go to this island this this very I don't know it seems like a very supernatural island like it might not even exist kind of thing like you know ov- go over the bridge kind of feeling you know death <laughs> um, is that uh the boatman will always question a couple with like a set of question to see how much they love each other or how much like you know if they like and the boatman can always tell if they lie or not that kind of thing so uh this widow that was telling her story to 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 beatrice was that uh they questioned her husband they questioned her and then after that he took he took his her, her husband over to the island and then after that came back and told her that nope i'm not gonna take you over there because you two don't really love each other or something like that like i i would not let you know i would not bring you over to the island so that was the the thing that the widow told the the beatrice but this time around around like between axel and beatrice beatrice is the one who's getting ferried over but not axel so what does this mean? And the way Axel is acting is like I don't know. The way Axel is re- acting is like it just reeks resentment. You know, he's casting suspicious eye towards this guy, he looks angry at him. And you know and then the fact that like you know Beatrice told, her, told him to oh go mend your friendship with the boatman you know like to make sure that he will bring you over to us and the boatman this narration by the boatman is like yeah I will definitely come back and bring you over to him but he, but the thing is it doesn't seem like he wants to like by the end of this it doesn't even seem like he wants to get ferried over to the island it's like something something is wrong with the ending not, not, not that like, not that it's a bad ending I'm saying like something feels wrong like Boatman is very much ready to come back and bring him, ferry him over to the island. While uh, the wife is very much trust trust this boatman, even though it's been time and time and time and time again her judgment is always false. She always trusts the wrong people because she's like just way too nice. Um. Yeah. Farewell then, Axel. Farewell, my one true love. Like, why do you say that? Why do you say that? Like, he's been calling her princess the entire fucking book. Farewell, my one true love. I heard him coming through the water. The sea intended a word for me. He spoke of mending up of our relationship, of our friendship. Yet, when I turn, he does not look my way. 
only to the land and to the low sun of the cove, and neither do I search for his eyes. He waits on past me, not glancing back. Wait for me on the shore, friend, I say quietly, but he does not hear and he waits on. It's like, he doesn't want, he, does, he doesn't care. He doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to go anymore. It's like he's done. <laughs> it just seems that way. I don't know. What do you guys think? Oh, Dimitri, how I how's life been treating you? Feels like I haven't seen you. Wow, this book was really not the book for me. Oh, really? <laughs> I I don't hate it. I don't, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> okay, hang on, hang on. I go get my tarot tarot deck. We are back. Okay, uh, a good doggo. Are you still here? A good doggo. Oh god. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Get rid of it. Yes, thank you. A good doggo, are you still here? If you're here, please. Okay, hello. Okay, um, alright. Can uh do you want do you want Okay, so basically uh do you wanna ask a question or do you want to uh just pull a cut cut of the day? Tell me how many times Oh you're in game? Where are you? Oh Tell uh, do, do you want do you want to ask a question to the tarot card? Uh, do you or or do you want to cut, pull a card of the day? Uh, tell me how many times you want to shuffle, and do I pick the card from the top or the bottom? <laughs> it's uh, in in the description of the. Uh, I don't uh, to uh, Dimitri. I don't hate it. I really don't. I don't hate it. Uh, but it's not. It's not one of my favorite. Uh, Ishiguro book. Definitely not one of my favorite. Because I feel like I, it feels experimental. The the book feels experimental. Like it's like that. He's trying. Like he's trying to write. A, he's trying to write a, a medieval fantasy and it feels amateurish to be honest but I don't hate it I don't hate it it could be better I feel it could be better ah you're Gail in game ah, sorry 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 sometimes it takes a while for me to like put two and two together did you finish reading it Dimitri or did you just listen I don't hate it it's it's okay <laughs> it's okay it's okay it's um oh, I haven't touched my tarot deck in a long time for a stream this is a special one Um Yeah, I'm not I'm I think I'm thinking more about the, the ending. You know. Th also thank you a good doggo for the redemption and also the follow. I really appreciate it. Every single follow is important. 
because I don't know why people. Yeah. Uh, also, if you're wondering why I don't have my avatar today, um, when I uh, when I started the stream, there's something wrong with the. It there's something wrong with like with my computer. I think I I need to restart my computer and see what's up. Call of the day. Okay, I'm gonna start now. Okay, spread and then sp spread and then. Uh, I will in I will intuitively pick the card for you. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Cut of the day for a good uh, gale. Stop grinding tea time. What do you mean? <laughs> okay, I got. I intuitively got a card for you. Okay, let's see what we get. Okay. Oh, it, oh, it is connected. Let's see, Gail. This is your card. You have the Page of Cups. Page of Cups. Oh, you're talking to the Page of Cups. Oh, oh, car of the day. Missy. Actually, you got, you got page of cups. Um, Reversed. So I'm gonna read you your car of the day. <laughs> please, please don't take this seriously. <laughs> okay, you got reverse page of cups. Okay. You may feel unmotivated, lethargic, uninspired. You may fail to launch a project, have setbacks, fail to commit. Don't find your passion or have self-limiting beliefs. Inner child have issue. Uh, inner child issues can come to the surface. Think about what is holding you back. Focus on your spiritual path to gain understanding. Nothing is permanent, and this phase too shall pass. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's okay to have days where you feel like shit. I guess. <laughs> am I doing? Am I making this worse? <laughs> it is. It is a card to diagnose. <laughs> With depression. <laughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> oh, I'm proud of you, Dimitri, for finishing such a big book. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh God. Thundering near me. <laughs> <laughs> background noise. <laughs> it's okay. I'm proud to be your background noise. <laughs> you, <laughs> you are so pretty. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just intuitively chose it for you, and it's like upright. It's like the it's like reverse page of cups, and I was like, <laughs> mm, should I be honest with her? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if you, uh, if you want more, <coughs> I can read more about it. Okay, I got a book with me. Okay, um, the river, <laughs> the, the page of cups reverse often indicates pain, 
resulting from an unhappy relationship or family situation. As a result, you feel insecure, afraid to trust, unwilling to seek love because you want to avoid more suffering. This card can show fear of rejection if you express your creative abilities or reveal your intuitive nature. Sometimes, it means you are withdrawing into a fantasy world. <laughs> the reverse. Oh my god. What the fuck is this? <coughs> the reverse page can also represent a sensitive young person who feels unaccepted or unloved or who hasn't trust anyone. <coughs> yeah. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You <laughs> the cards don't lie. It's true the cards don't lie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll let you choose, okay? Okay. I, I, do you want okay, do you <laughs> Do you want do you want me to read you uh, the definition of this card for mo for money or for job or for love or all three of them <laughs> and I can read I can read that for you money job or love or all three of them it's okay I can read all for you just for today it's just the day of the uh, the card of the day it's just for today for love oh yeah hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> In reading about love, the page reverse warns you to take a good hard look at a relationship. This card may show you may show you repeating a pattern of heartbreak and betrayal rooted in childhood. Perhaps you have opened your heart to the wrong person or fantasize that a romantic fling is something more serious. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you get this card. I don't know why you got. I don't know why you got this card, and it's reversed too. Oh my god. <laughs> Written by a miserable guy. <laughs> no, if it's it's if it's upright, right? Okay, so page put so page of cup in in general, regardless, uh, upwards or reverse, page of cups is a naive naive person. Represents a naive person and immaturity, and lack of boundaries. So, a page of cups is it's, it's a card. It's not. It, I'm not saying that it's a like a essentially negative card. It's just a card. Yeah, it's just that this this card represents someone very naive about things around her, him or her. So. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, somebody can redeem another uh, card, I guess, or maybe redeem a poem. I can read a poem for you guys. I can read a a, a haiku for you guys. I can read a, a quote on love for you guys. You guys can you guys can redeem those things. That's in my uh, Banuna points redemption. <coughs> maybe maybe those will be more uh, positive. I hope I don't know. Don't take this seriously. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. They basically that's what they say. The page reverse wants you to take a good hard look at your relationship. This card may show you repeating a pattern of heartbreak or betrayal rooted in childhood. Perhaps you have opened your heart to the wrong person or fantasized that a romantic fling is something more serious. So Oh god, oh shit. <laughs> oh no, the end. Are you, are you sure? <laughs> the end. 
Alright. Shuffle five. Listen. One, two, three, four, five. Count the day for the end. Oh my god, <laughs> the end, okay, don't freak out, okay, you have a reversed card as well, I don't know why, I don't know why I'm getting the reversed card. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at all the cards, it's like reversed as well, like, like, I mean, I mean, so they are not all all of them are not not it's not all of them that are reversed but okay you got your reversed you got the lovers reverse <laughs> not all reverse are bad okay not all rivers are bad it's not like that and you got the dn has the lovers reverse <laughs> i'm sorry The lovers, <laughs> the lovers reversed. Okay, it's it's just kind of the day, okay? Just for today. You can check back tomorrow or something. <laughs> okay, the, the lovers reversed. <laughs> you think so? If there is imbalance and disharmony in your relationships. Focus on self-love and making yourself a priority to find alignment and harmony. You may be reluctant to open your heart to a relationship for fear of getting hurt. Become aware of what, of what you value and need. That's a good, that's a good advice, I would think. <clears throat> the lovers reversed. <laughs> see the see twisty twisty is right. The cards never lie. It's just I I took it out intuitively to you, for you guys. And you are the one who asked me to shuffle, the, you know, how many times and all that. If there is imbalance and disharmony in your relationship, focus on the self-love and making yourself a priority to find alignment and harmony. You may be reluctant to open your heart to a relationship for fear of getting hurt. Become aware of what you value and need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, <laughs> yes, you are. You are right. <laughs> yes, Gil, you are right. <laughs> All right. Uh, the end. Do you want me to read about job, money, or love? The reverse. Love? Okay. In reading about love, the lover's reverse can indicate you and a lover are separated by circumstances, location, responsibilities, or even death. Uh, no, it doesn't mean that your partner will die, but it can symbolize a lover who has gone to the other side and how you are dealing with this. Sometimes it represents manipulation, a loveless relationship, incompatibility, or quarreling. It can also encourage you to heal an inner reef. So it's not, a, it's not about, it's not all bad. It's just, yeah, it's, 
encourage you to heal an inner rift. Okay, this is, there's a this is a quote from someone called Jane Stern, uh, or from the book uh, Confessions of a Tarot Reader. Okay, can you make someone help? Uh, sorry, this is this is the quote. Okay, can you make someone love you? No. Can you make some? Can you make yourself love someone else? Not much. Can you live without either being loved or loving a partner? It is probably the hardest task on this earth, but you can. And in the long run, clearing your closets of relationships that no longer work is frightening, but an utter necessity. The worst thing that can happen is you are the only one left in the equation, and you must learn to love yourself. There you go. Self love. Self love. Very important in the end. Self love. Love yourself. Also, girl, you're fucked. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My god. <laughs> oh, oh, Dimitri wants. Okay, five minutes ago, Dimitri wanted a um, poem. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Let's, let's move on to. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to take a... Okay, I have a few. But I'm going to... Let me see, let me see. I have a lot of like poet poem books. Like compilation poem books. But I don't know. Don't know which one. Okay. Alright, uh, Dimitri, I'll let you... I'll let you choose. Do you want... Poems from Carol and Duffy, Edward Thomas, or Emily Dickinson. Are you still there, Dimitri? Oops. Dimitri? Do you want... Poem by Emily Dickinson, Carol and Duffy, or Ed Edward Thomas? <coughs> Edward Thomas, Carol, Edward Tom, uh, Edward Carol, or Emily? Let me know. Do you want a poem uh, from <coughs> Emily Thomas? Sorry, Emily Edward or Carol? Emily Edward Carol. Emily Edward Carol. Dimitri, are you still there? Dimitri fell asleep. No, Dimitri is at work. Usually Dimitri is at work. Uh, or going to work. How do you know? <laughs> I'm keeping my carol. Guys, please, next time when I go stream, please um, get more. Uh, ask me to do more tarot reading. I really love it. It's funny. It's funny to me. <laughs> Oh, okay, bye bye. Thank you so much for jumping by and for the follow. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like reading. Dimitri! <laughs> the card must be so fly. <laughs> Maybe 
if you have such a strong reaction to it, maybe some part of it is true, you know? Because if it's not true, you don't react that way. <laughs> is missing what do i do yes. oh my god i just need you to choose which poem should i read because it's not it's not fun if i choose it for you Oh my god, so good. <clears throat> he can't be gone in like fucking five minutes time. You know? Is there a way to ping him? Read a poem. I don't know. Or maybe you guys... I mean, it's pointless if I read it even when he's not here, right? Limit 3. Waiting, ice waiting. Some quotes until it's read some quotes until. Oh, uh, draw a tower for myself. I'll draw a tower for myself. I'll choose a card. Yeah, I can. Just <laughs> Yeah, you want it? Are you? Decide dinner? How do I decide dinner with tarot cards? Cannot. Cannot. Where did where did Mimichi go? <laughs> no, redemption is like eleven minutes ago. When I saw it it was like five minutes ago and then I have been asking until now and it hasn't gotten back to me. Um, uh, I guess I will do it for myself. Oh, okay. If you can't just if you <laughs> oh depends on your definition of eat. <laughs> uh, okay, my cut today is um. Oh, three of cups. Oh, see, I tell you, not all cups are bad. I got three of cups today. Three of cups, and it's like not reverse. Okay, see, there is a potential that you get a non-reverse cup. Three of cups is a really good cup. <laughs> that's my that's my cup card of the day. Three of cups. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, there are reunions, celebrations, gathering in your life. You are spending quality time with people you cherish. These are happy times, uplifting energies and good feeling. You are enjoying the company of others. There's laughing, love and support. This can be a good time to celebrate your success with close friends and family and to collaborate with others. <laughs> The laugh, the laughter part is definitely true. <laughs> oh my god, it's too good. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm I'm spending quality time with you guys. <clears throat> Cheer cups. Yeah, this is. The book says the same. You're enjoying good time with people you care about. And, uh... 
and it can also indicate expressing love, inspiration, and creativity with a community of like-minded people. Uh, the common bond between you fills your cup and brings blessings to all. Yeah, that's my that's my card of the day. <laughs> Here I'll do another pull for you. Maybe it will be a very good one. But for today, your card is reversed page of cups. Which is not really bad. Just uh, <coughs> look at it as a warning card warning card. Like you know, call out cards, calling you out for something. Telling you something that you don't want to hear, but you have to hear it, you know. Can't be bad, yeah. That kind of cards are good. It's considered good to being to like being like you know being warned, you know that you know don't settle for anything bad, anything less than you deserve, you know. Oh, oh that one is about. Ah, oh, Dimitri is gone. I don't know what to do. have to leave in half an hour yeah yeah it's funny yeah of course it's funny it's a lot of fun reading tarot cards is a lot of fun i love reading <coughs> i love reading tarot cards yeah like super fun so yeah we did more of it next time oh, i don't know what to do 15 minutes and dimitri is gone maybe i'll uh, read it next time i see him I gotta be reminded though. Yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah, I was thinking definitely. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll read it next time he locks on. I think maybe he's driving to work. Probably. I know he goes to work around this time. Or I don't know. Maybe he's maybe eating breakfast or something. All right, guys. Uh. In regards of what we are going to read the next time. Ah, uh, okay. Hang on. Hey, the ends is uh, in a very lovey-dovey mood now today. Okay, page thirty-three. Alright, so I have I have with me is a book. Uh, called Love Selected Quotations uh, from the author of The Alchemist Paolo Coelho he uh, so it's not poems it's just quotes just to make that distinction clear page 33 okay unfortunately page 33 is a illustration I will send a picture to you because I know your but so please choose another page, please. I'll send a picture to you. I think you will like it. It's a it's an illustration somehow. The uh thirty two is also an illustration. So <laughs> No 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 you know you didn't you didn't miss it. You didn't miss it. I know you are going to work. I knew it. I know you're going to work. Okay, let me get to the uh, quote date. The uh, uh, the quote on love first. The end. Thirty two is also an illustration. So I read his poem first. Oh, you're so nice. Okay. <laughs> okay, Dimitri, you have three choices. Uh, do you want me to read poems by uh Carol and Duffy or Edward? Thomas or Emily Dickinson? Do you hear anything? Yeah, the underground is. Do you want a poem from Carol Ann Duffy, Edward Thomas, or Emily Dickinson? <laughs> no, 
it's okay. It's okay. Emily is like fucking up, like you know, classic. So it's okay. I also like Emily. I like. I barely know who Carol and Duffy is. I just bought it because I like poems. Edward Thomas is Edward Thomas. I uh I got the book from a thrift store in Sydney, Australia. It was ten dollars. There's a yeah. Actually, the price is still there. Written in, written in. Uh, okay, Emily. Let's go, Emily. Let's go, Emily. I like Emily. Okay, can you give me a page? Uh, can you choose a page between? Sorry. Good. Can you choose a number between one to what between one to one? S uh, sorry, between one to five seven six. You're not illiterate. If you're illiterate, you can't read this. Five. <laughs> okay, playing it. Okay. Oh, a long one. You got a long one. <laughs> that just came out wrongly. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm reading a poem by Emily Dickinson, as requested by Dimitri. Uh, poem number five. Uh, let me see. It's written circa eighteen fifty eight. Okay, eighteen fifty eight. A poem written in eighteen fifty eight. I had a guinea golden. I lost it in the sand, and though the sum was simple, and pounds were in the land, still had it such a value, unto my frugal eye, that I could not find it. I sat me down to sigh. I had a crimson robin, robin, who sang full many a day, but when the woods were painted, he too. Did fly away. Time brought me other robins. Their ballads were the same. Still, for my missing troubadour, I kept the house at home. I had a star in heaven. One pleiad was its name. And when I was not heeding, it wandered from the same. And though the skies are crowded. And all the nights a shine, I do not care about it, since none of them are mine. My story has a moral. I have a missing friend. Pleaded its name, and Robin, and Guinea in the sand, and when this mournful ditty, accompanied with tear, shall meet the eye of traitor, in country far from here. Grant that re that repentance solemn may seize upon his mind, and he ha and he no consolation beneath the sun may find. Sorry, I fucked it up on the last one. <coughs> Sorry, I should have drink water before that. There you go. A poem written. In eighteen fifty eight, published in eighteen ninety six. I have time, I can read that again. I like it. 
had a guinea golden and lost it in the sand. And though the sum was simple and pounds were in the land, still had it such a value unto my frugal eye that when I could not find it, I sat me down to sigh. I had a crimson robin who sang full many a day, but when the woods were painted, he too did fly away. Time brought me other robins, their ballads were the same. Still, for my missing troubadour, I kept the house at home. I had a star in heaven, one pleaded was its name. And when I was not heeding, it wandered from the same. And though the skies are crowded, and all the nights are shine, I do not care about it, since none of them are mine. My story has a moral, I have a missing friend, Pleads its name and robin, and guinea in the sand. And when, it, and when this mournful ditty accompanied with tear, Shall meet the eye of traitor in country far from here, Grant that repentance solemn may seize upon his mind, And he no consolation beneath the sun may find. If, yeah, you are lucky because Emily Dickinson is fucking depressing. His poems usually are very, very depressing. So you actually you actually pick a very good one. You pick a you pick a really cute one. Hey. The end. Your your thirty one, thirty one, thirty one, three one, three one, three one. Okay. A quote on love for DM. Okay, <clears throat> it's from the book by the river Piedra. I sat down and wept. I don't know if it's a book or not, but it's uh, from uh, a writing by Paolo Coelho. Okay, this is a quote of, of love, quote on love for the end. Okay? Love doesn't ask many questions because once we start thinking, we start to feel afraid. It's an inexplicable fear and there's no point putting it into words. Risk are there to be taken. The end. Why does it sound like it's very? But why, why does it sound like it's related to your tarot reading? The end. The end. <laughs> Love doesn't ask many questions. Because once we start thinking, we start to feel afraid. It's an inexplicable fear, and there's no point putting it into words. Risks are there to be taken. Well, Dimitri, you know, um, poems usually are just, to me, poems are just, if you don't... If you I know, I know when we go into a literature class and then the teacher is like telling you, okay, this, like, explain to me what this poet, poet is trying to say in this poem. No! Don't give a fuck. It, 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 po some poems don't mean anything. Some poems are just there because the poet decided to write what's happening in their day. One very very depressing. Oh no, I shouldn't end this with a depressing poem by Emily Dickinson because she is hyper depressing. But I'll tell you more about Emily Dickinson next time. <laughs> her her poems are very depressing. Usually, her poems are always about like death and like funeral and like you know stuff like that. Exactly. Right? 
right, Dimitri, tell the end then. Damn. You today you got like so many so many good advice from the universe. It's not from me, it's from the universe. The universe is telling you something, yeah. I don't know what I don't know what you're going through, but you can always tell me about it. Um Yeah. Anyway. I was thinking since we are sorry. Since we've finished a medieval British uh theme fantasy book. Sorry, I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. Uh since we just finished a medieval fantasy book. I was thinking our next book will be an ancient Japanese court house. Uh, uh, an ancient Japanese pa palace story. Next, so we go from we go from um, western to eastern in uh, two different reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Hey, so uh, I have decided that uh, we will be reading the Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu next time. Okay. So just give you a little bit of a of a rundown of uh, the Tale of Genji. Uh, in uh, this is what's written at the back of the book. In the 11th century, Murasaki Shikibu, a lady in the Heian court of Japan, wrote the world's first novel. But the tale of Genji is no mere artifact. It is rather a lively and astonishingly nuanced portrait of a refined society where every dalliance is an act of political consequence, a play of characters whose inner lives are as rich and changeable as those imagined by Proust. Chief of this is the shining Genji, the son of the emperor, and a man whose passionate impulses create great turmoil in his world and very nearly destroy him. This edition, recognized as, it, as the finest version in English, contained a dozen chapters from, the early, from early in the book, carefully chosen by the translator Edward G. Seidensticker. What a great name, Seidensticker. With an introduction explaining the selection, it is illustrated throughout with woodcuts from a 17th century edition. So, this is an abridged but translated and abridged version. It's not the entire story, but translated by Edward G. Seiden Sticker and abridged by him as well. He chose like the best chapters, I guess, the most interesting chapters. So, yeah, so basically, we're going from west to east mm, this time. We are going to be reading The Tale of Genji. And, um,. I am not going to attempt to try to separate the books into sections uh, to read. What I'm going to do is this. I will set an alarm whereby I will read for only two hours or two and a half hours at most each time. Because I feel like if I keep doing this fucking three, four hour stream, I might just die. So. Uh, yeah, so it would be something like if the alarm rings in the midst of me reading uh, a chapter and I know that there's like a few more pages left, I'm going to continue reading it. I'm not going to just stop it. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not just going to stop. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So two to two and a half hours at most. I can't do three hours reading anymore. I'm too old for this. Uh, yeah. Dian! Yeah. Isn't it great? You got, like, you know, great advice today. Uh, thank you. I mean, okay, let's run down today's, okay? Thank you to Dale. A uh, Gail, sorry, I keep calling you Dale. Gail for the follow and for hanging out with us. 
sorry, <laughs> hanging out with us and playing with us, you know, tarot card and everything. Uh, uh, I hope you learned something from your tarot cards. Uh, and you too, the end. <laughs> uh, uh, Dimitri, the uh, yeah, I, 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 sh I should have talked more about the Buried Giant. Like, overall, I don't hate it. Uh, I don't dislike it. I, I, I'm okay with it. I actually enjoy reading it out loud. It's actually one of the one of the most fun reading sessions that I could get because there's so many dialogues, so it's actually quite fun. But story wise, it's definitely not not one of the best from uh, Ishiguro. Ishiguro has way better books than this. So, um, but yeah, I'm glad to have finished the Buried Giant. Uh, took us four readings. Four parts in total. It's pretty good, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the reading session. And I hope, and I look forward to seeing you guys again the next time. I I hope to fix this problem with my um my avatar. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys are watching like an empty martini glass. <laughs> uh, my apologies. Anyway, yes. Um. Uh. Yeah. Um, thank you Twisty and Dian for moderating. Thank you Dian for the party finder. I really appreciate it. Uh, um, yeah, I'll try my best. I'll try my best to read like at least twice a week. I don't think I can do two times three times anymore, but I'll do twice. Um, uh, what's some call it? Um, I can't promise what day I'm going to stream next week, but I will tell you when I go live on. Twitter and Discord. Okay. Um, until then, uh, if you want to catch up on the the previous reading session on the the buried giant, uh, feel free to go to my YouTube channel. Uh, I recommend YouTube because it's like so much more easier to 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 load videos on YouTube than compared to Twitch. I know that because. It's very hard to find videos in, in Twitch as well, so it's so much easier to find videos on uh, on on my YouTube channel. So follow me, uh, uh subscribe to me on, uh, uh, YouTube as well. Tell your friends about me. Uh, if they're interested in someone reading books, uh, uh, share the good words. Follow me on Twitch, uh, and Twitter. Join my Discord. Uh, I. Like I said in the beginning, I don't spam a lot. My, I don't really post a lot on Twitter. I don't really... Any gameplay in between. I uh, actually want to play Yakuza uh, 6. I want, I want to play it again. I want to finish the game. Uh, but I'm just like... It will be like evening stream if I do. Or I'll do another chill minecraft gameplay where i scream a lot because it's actually a horror game um but yeah but if anything i will definitely tweet it out when i go live uh until then yes thank you so much Dian, for linking the actually came from youtube but yeah follow like subscribe to me as well on youtube thank you um i actually gotta go to somewhere i gotta go out <laughs> i haven't even prepared to go out yet yeah shit i have like an hour to reach there um i gotta i gotta shut the fuck up and go <laughs> basically okay guys um uh, gail dm twisty uh, Dimitri, everyone, thank you for being here with me today. I appreciate it a lot, and I love all of you. Come and play again with me. Uh, tarot cards, poems, quotes on love. I love, 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 love doing those things for you guys, because it's lots of fun. Um, have fun, and I'll see you guys next stream. Okay, take care of yourself. Uh, mentally, physically. Love yourself, dear. <laughs> Everyone, love yourself. Because you deserve to be loved by yourself. Until then, I love you guys. I'm 
I'm gonna send you off with my favorite song in the world. Have a good day. Have you ever had a dream that, 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 that you, you, you can do, do, skip, do, 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 skip, you wanna do, do, skip, 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 do, skip